Hi, and welcome to this um, Microsoft Virtual Academy course on SQL Database Fundamentals. Um, I'm Graham Malcolm uh, from Microsoft, and I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Chris Randall here. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris. I'm a senior content developer with Microsoft, uh, or as we say around here, same as Graham. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, there's a slide that we're showing here with some information about Chris that tells you a little bit about uh, his background. There's a very nice picture of his dog as well. Uh, if, if you're confused about that, Chris is the one on the left. And uh, there's also a, a rather nice slide with uh, me looking kind of cool and relaxed, which is, is not really how I normally feel. No, but... Well, I couldn't find one with sunglasses, so that's why I picked the <laughs> one with my dog. <laughs> yeah, I never get enough good weather for that. So that's us. Uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about us. Really, the important thing that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about working with um, databases. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just giving you a kind of introduction to, to databases and some of the concepts. It should be pretty interesting. All right, Chris, you want to lead us through what we're going to talk about? Sure. Um, so this uh, course is broken out into uh, half a dozen modules, uh, such as this brief introduction, which we'll ro roll right into our getting started with tables. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the structures of database tables and, and where they live and why you need them. Uh, we'll talk about how to get data into them, how to get data out of them, how to make changes. Um, and then we'll move into uh, sort of the system support for, uh, uh, for, for databases. We'll get into topics like indexes and other things that are used to optimize databases. We'll talk a, a little bit about uh, different data types that are native to SQL Server and relational databases, and then we'll move into um, non-relational database and, and other types of, of data that we might store. Uh, and then we'll finish up with a brief look at the kinds of things that a database administrator or a DBA uh, performs on a regular basis. Graham? All right, yeah, that sounds like a, a pretty packed schedule. So uh, as you see, let's roll right on in there and start with an introduction to, to what databases are and, and what kind of things we can do with them. So I, I guess when people think about data, a, a lot of people who are um, familiar with working with tools like Excel, for example, probably think about something that looks a bit like this. You might think of, of data that, that looks like a, a table of data in something like Excel. So the widgets and thingy bobs and knickknacks. Widgets and thingy bobs and knickknacks. So you, you can imagine that somebody who's, who's keeping track, perhaps you're a small company, perhaps you're just keeping track of some stock, you might do something like this. Now, Technically, I guess you could say that's sort of a database. There's, there's well, certainly data there. Well, Excel is the world's most popular database. Isn't it? <laughs> Indeed it is. Excel is the world's most popular database. It's perhaps not the most efficient way to store that data. So I want to I kind of walk through some of the limitations of storing data in a table in, in a, a spreadsheet like that. So let's, let's take a look at some examples here. So here's that data um, in, in a table form. We're taking it out of the, the spreadsheet here. We've just got that same table of data. Can you, can you see anything that's, that's perhaps a bit funky about that, something that's not great? Well, I'm looking at that column for color, and I'm seeing that there's multiple values in a couple of those rows. We've got blue and red for thingy bob. We've got red and black for knickknack. Right, exactly. So, so we, I mean, obviously the intent here is that thingy bobs are available in blue or red. So for color, we've stored two values in that one column. Now, that's, that's not ideal. Um, we, we really want to be um, storing just one value in each column. So what we, we want to do is go through a process. Technically, the process is called normalization. Um, you won't be quizzed on that later, so don't worry too much about that. But we're going to use a process called normalization. And the first thing we need to do is put, the, put this table, put this data into what we call first normal form is the technical term. And what that really means is we shouldn't have any columns that have more than one value in them. So let's, let's take a look at how we do that. And we'll just uh, animate this, uh, this table. You can see there's the, the, the columns that are problematic. We've got those, those double values in there. So what we'll do is we'll just split those out, and we've now got separate rows. So each, we've, we've satisfied first normal form. Each, each column supports only one value. But there is still kind of a, a, a few problems with this. And I'm looking particularly at the supplier. Um, what, what, what can you see there that might be an issue for me? Well, I, I see some redundancies. I see uh, the same supplier stored in multiple rows. We've got Contoso three times, Northwind twice. Exactly, yeah. So we, we've got data there that's stored in multiple, um, multiple rows, as you say. It's duplicated. And of course, that, that means if I ever had to change, if Northwind changed their name, I'd have to actually go and change it in, in each of the rows where it appears. And that's, that's pretty inefficient. And I'm using up more space than I necessarily need to store the data. So at this point, we want to move into what we call second normal form, where we start separating those, those values out into separate tables. And each table represents an entity in my database. So I can go ahead. I can see there, there's the problematic column. I can go ahead and I can split that out. And now I've got a product table and a supplier table. And I've assigned a unique ID to each supplier. I've assigned a unique ID to each product. 
and I'm using the ID for the supplier in the product table to say, hey, this is the supplier for this product. And we could even do that with some of the other columns, couldn't we? We could do that with color. Yep, absolutely. We've got we the same, do that with same problem with, with um, color. So we can go ahead and we could do that. And again, we, we split that out. So we've now got our color table and we've got our uh, product table. Now, there's, there's a, we're not quite there yet. There's a few other issues we need to deal with here. So let's just have a look at this, this problem here. We've got the color ID and we've got the product ID, but there's nothing that says which color is which product. Right, so, so we have a bit of an issue there. Now, there isn't really a business entity that, that we can use to, to deal with this, but we can create a table. Effectively, it's a table that just enables the join. It's, it's a, a nice, efficient way of saying, here's a table that joins the product table to the color table, kind of intermediary table. So it maps between them. Yeah, mapping table is a good way of thinking of that. So I've now taken my, my uh, data that was originally just a, a table in Excel, and I've split it out into multiple tables, and I've, I've joining them based on keys. So it's beginning to look much more like a, what we would think of as a relational database. There is still another problem. Can you spot the other problem here? Well, if we go back to the original product table, we don't see a connection, do we? Let's see, we've got product to our color. We don't have product and supplier. We don't have, well, we, we've got the oh, supplier. Well, we, uh, we, that's supplier we have that directly in, in the column. I'll give you a hint. Does a product have a phone number? No, nor do phone numbers have that many digits, but. <laughs> We'll, we'll give you a pass on that. We'll, we'll ignore that for the time being. <laughs> but uh, products don't have phone numbers. That's so, right. so we've got phone in there, but that, that really isn't related to a product. That's actually something to do with the supplier. Right. So we have this, this concept of making sure that all of the columns in a table depend on the primary key for that table. They all depend on what that table is about. So in this case, products don't have phone numbers. Really, that whole column should be moved across to the supplier table because suppliers have phone numbers. And in doing that, we reduce a bit of redundancy as well because we've now got... The, the telephone number for each supplier in the sure. supplier table. So this is now in what we call third normal form. Now there are a whole bunch of, of other higher level normal forms we could go into and wax lyrical about. We don't need to do that for, for our purposes in a database. Usually third normal form is, is pretty much as far as we need to go. But what we've now got is a database that consists of multiple tables with keys that identify uniquely each row within each table and foreign keys in the other tables that we can use to relate one table to another. And we've removed redundancies. Yeah. We made it easier to update. Is it any faster to query? Not necessarily any faster to query. In fact, in some ways, it's going to be more complicated now because we're reading from more uh, tables. So later on in this course, we're going to look at ways that we can optimize queries um, for, for dealing with these tables. But for the time being, we've, we've now reduced the redundancy. We've got a pretty efficient way to store sure. our data. So we can think of what we've done as, as being creating the database, what we call the schema of the database, effectively the tables that are in the database. We need to think about how that database is actually stored. And what we do is we take that and we store it in on disk in something called a, a database management system. So it's on a server, really. It's typically in an organization, there's a, a computer that's the server, and it's, it's running some software that's a, a database management system. And examples of that are things like SQL Server. Microsoft SQL Server 2016 is our latest version of a, a database. There's also a, the, the option to perhaps connect to that database from various different clients over a network, which is typically how people access them. And of course, that may not even be on the same local network. It may be in, the, in what we call the cloud. It might be hosted on a, an internet server somewhere like Microsoft Azure. So I could have a virtual machine in Azure that's running SQL Server, or I could use something like an Azure service. There's an Azure SQL database, which provides me with a, a database system in, in the cloud. So we've got these, this idea of having the data stored in that schema on disk in a database system that's accessed over the network from various different clients. Make sense? Sure. So one of the things we might want to think about when we're uh, accessing that is, of course, some sort of security. So typically, if we're accessing something in, in the uh, internet, not necessarily just on the cloud, even internally on a network, you might have something called a firewall that limits the, the clients that can actually connect to it. And you'll, you'll certainly want to have some sort of identity check, some sort of authentication that, that makes sure that people are connecting who are allowed to connect and that anybody who isn't allowed to connect is, is you know, forbidden from getting to it. So there are some other considerations that we need to think about, and we'll talk about those later on uh, when we look at the admin of this. But that's, that's kind of how the, the system works. Well, now that we understand a little bit about the, the concepts behind this, we know a little bit about database schemas, we know a little bit about the, the way a database server works, why don't you uh, jump in the driving seat and actually show us how we can, uh, we can see a database being created and managed? Sure. Let's take a look at the demo.
In this demonstration, we'll take a look at a couple different ways to create SQL databases and review the initial configuration. For this demo, I'm going to get started with Azure SQL Database. And the reason I'll do that will, will be clear, I hope, because it's going to take a few minutes for it to run in the background, and I can cut over and show you how to create databases in uh, SQL Server Management Studio for on-premise databases or virtual machines. So let's start here at the Azure portal. I've logged in with my Microsoft account. I'm looking at my dashboard, and I'm going to create a new Azure SQL database. And there will be a number of, of decisions you'll need to make, and this course isn't designed to go through all of those decisions and all of those configuration options, but you'll get a flavor of uh, what's involved. Um, I do want to commend you to some of our other MVA programs on uh, Azure SQL database. So I'm going to go ahead and specify that I want to create a new database. And I'll go to Data and Storage, and I'll choose SQL Database. And the blade will open where I can start the configuration. I'll be asked for a name. It'll populate with my subscription information, and there'll be other information I'll change as I go. So one of the most important things, of course, is going to be the name of the database, because that's going to be used by every application uh, and perhaps every ad hoc report user that's going to be connecting to this. So I'll give this, hopefully, a clear name. Uh, we'll call this uh, MV MVA uh, Fundamentals Demo, and I'll use my Azure subscription. Um, Azure offers a couple of different ways of deploying SQL databases. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've made these before, and I'll use an existing resource group to make it easier for myself to clean up. I've got a resource group called MVA Demos. But as you get deeper into Azure, you'll find that there are a number of resources that get created uh, just in the process of creating a virtual machine or a SQL database or other items. And resource groups are a nice way to uh, keep them together and make it convenient to manage. All right, well, I want to create a new database, and Azure uh, gives me the opportunity here to either start from scratch with a blank database, uh, to use one of the samples available, or even to restore from a backup of another SQL database in Azure. Um, I'll start with a blank database. I'm then asked what logical server I want to put this on, and I have the ability either to choose from one of my existing logical servers, or I can create a new server and, and walk through that whole process. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to keep this fairly straightforward. I'll use one of my existing servers. Um, but I do want to point out that if you're going to create your, new, your own new server, uh, you will need to configure firewall rules to enable you to connect to it, and you will need, uh, you will need to uh, provision uh, an administrator account. All right, so let's go ahead and walk down through my choices. Now, what pricing tier do I want? Um, this is a much longer discussion than we're going to have right now. But in a nutshell, a pricing tier uh, is a way of bundling a performance level in something we call database transaction units. And it's a combination of uh, compute resources and storage resources and some other features that enable us to uh, control how responsive the SQL database is going to be. For the purposes of this demo, I'll choose a P1. We'll see that's going to give me up to 500 gigabytes of storage. It's going to automatically include geo-replication and point-in-time restore. Uh, there are a whole long list of these uh, pricing tiers. Uh, and again, I encourage you to hit the Azure documentation to learn the differences between them if you're going to be using Azure SQL databases. I'm also going to be asked about a collation, and uh, a collation in brief is a combination of uh, character set and sort order, which will uh, uh, drive how things like your applications will uh, communicate with uh, the database. I'll leave my default here, my SQL Latin 1 general code page 1, case insensitive ascending sort. That's my default here in, uh, in uh, the US. When I'm done with this, I'll want it to be pinned to the dashboard of the portal just for convenience. That doesn't really have anything to do with creating a database, but it will make it easier for me to find it and show it to you. All right, well, I'll go ahead and, and click Create. And it says, hey, if you made any changes in some of the other blades, uh, we're going to get rid of them. That's fine with me. And I'll see a message here that says that I am uh, submitting the deployment to the server. That's going to take a few minutes, so I'm going to let that cook in the background. And in the meantime, I'm going to switch over to SQL Server Management Studio, which I have connected to a local instance here on my laptop. So let's put the portal away for now, and let's bring up SQL Server Management Studio. And here in SQL Server Management Studio for SQL Server 2016, uh, I've got a connection to my local laptop here, which is called Shoal. 
I am logged in as myself um, and I've given myself uh, during installation I've given myself uh, administrative privileges but one of the things you want to make sure you do when you install your own SQL Server is make sure that you also create an account that has permissions to access it and uh, for that first account anyway permission to do things like create databases and so forth. So in this view of SQL Server Management Studio, I have a list of what databases are available to me on this particular instance. Um, and as we mentioned in the presentation, an instance is uh, essentially a running copy of SQL Server. You can have multiple instances on one machine. Uh, based on what the uh, resource load is going to be and how much performance your machine has. Um, and on this instance, I have uh, several user databases. There's an old sample here called AdventureWorks 2016 CTP3, and then a couple of samples that I pulled down from Microsoft.com that are the new samples for SQL Server 2016. Um, in this interface, I have access to the databases and the objects within them, everything from tables and views and the service broker settings and security settings. But I've also got access to system level features such as system level security. Who's allowed to log into uh, this instance? What are they allowed to do when they get here? And so on. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, I simply want to set up a database and make it ready for future demos. So I'm going to start by generating a script from one of the existing databases and reviewing its results. So using a feature of SQL Server Management Studio, I'm right-clicking on Wide World Importers. I'm going to specify that I want to script it out as a create operation to a new editor window. Now I could script this right to a file on disk, I could script this to my clipboard and so on, but let's use a new query editor window. And we'll see a lot of T-SQL has been generated here. And we're not going to walk through all of this, but I do want to show you some of the critical things that are part of creating a new database in SQL Server. So I'll walk through and I'll highlight certain key things as we go. And if you're interested in more of, of uh, the other options, uh, I encourage you to take a look at, at uh, uh, MSDN and Books Online, and I encourage you to take a look at some of our other courses. So the first thing this script had to do was to switch to the master database, which is a, a system level configuration database. And then we'll see comments, which are these bits in, well, they were in green before I uh, highlighted them in yellow, but we'll see those are T-SQL comments. And that's simply documenting what's being scripted at any given point when the script was generated. And now we get to the good part, the create database statement. So that's, that's our key, and there are many, many options, but we're going to focus on the, the, the core ones here. So we'll say create database, and we'll give that database a name, such as create database wide world importers. At a minimum, that's all you need to do. SQL Server comes with a number of default settings, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some of those when we create our own database in a few minutes. But at a minimum, that will then put the, the data files and transaction log files for this database in the default locations for that particular server instance. It will have a default size and other default settings. But let's review some of those settings that are available to us. So create database wide world importers. Uh, we'll, we'll skip containment for, for now, but that's a, a security feature for later. Then there's a setting here for what file group it's going, uh, uh, going to be uh, using. Then this is going to be one called user data. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a more advanced course. But the key thing here is that we're specifying that this database has a file that we're going to give a nickname or a logical name of WWI primary. And the actual file is going to be located in my file system. Now that is a default location and we never recommend that you uh, place your user databases in that default location. And once you're in an environment with uh, a SAN, for example, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be placing your data files on that SAN. But I've got a, 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 just a, a developer laptop here and I'm putting things in local locations that aren't going to live forever, so I'm not terribly worried about the, the uh, locations. However, just for comparison's sake, let me just show you what I've done here for my own databases. Uh, on my C drive, I've created a, uh, a, a folder called SQL Data. I'm trying to zoom in so we can see it. And uh, uh, I've just, on my SQL Data directory here, I've created some folders here for data, transaction logs, and backup. And then I've marked those as the default for this instance so that as I add new databases, they will by default be placed in those locations. And we'll take a look at how that goes. All right, let's get back to SQL Server Management Studio. So one of the things we need to do to create a database is we need to specify where the files are going to go. And at a minimum, you'll start with two types of files in a SQL Server. You'll start with a data file. And so if we scroll all the way to the end of this long path, we'll see that we're creating a data file called wideworldimporters.mdf. 
MDF is just a convention for the extension. There's no requirement that you call it that way, but it, that's what most of us tend to do so that other DBAs looking at our work can understand what they're seeing. And as I mentioned, there are defaults for lots and lots of things, but you can also specify things like what the starting size is going to be, whether it can grow, and if so, how much, and what that growth increment should be. And these we get into in, in more advanced uh, uh, developer and administrative courses, but just understand that there are a number of things you can do to control that, and we'll take a look at them uh, a, a little later. So we'll create a, 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 a initial data file. There's some other files here that this particular sample is using. I'm going to ignore for now. And we'll also specify then that we need a transaction log. And so we're creating something here called WWI log. And again, it's got a long path and file name here to create a file called worldwideimporters.ldf. And that transaction log file is so important to SQL Server because of the way the SQL Server engine uh, writes changes from memory down to disk and records a history of those actions in the transaction log. So to create a database at a minimum, we're going to want a data file, and we're going to want a log, and we're either going to uh, specify our own settings, or we're going to uh, allow the defaults to kick in. And for the purposes of our discussion here, the rest of all of these settings are simply ways of recording in the script what the DBA who created this database did uh, in setting it up. So let's take another approach to this. If I go back to my Object Explorer, and I right-click on the Databases folder under my instance, I can click on New Database, and I'll get a dialog box with some choices very similar to what we've just been looking at, such as what do we want to call our new database? Where do you want the data file to go and what should it be called? Where do you want the log file and, where sh and what should it be called? And a long list of options, many of which were recorded in that script that we just looked at. So let's take a, a, a straightforward starting approach to creating a new database, and I will call this MVA Demo Local DB, as opposed to the cloud database that I've got running in the background right now. And I will review then the logical names for the files that will be created, so MVA Demo Local DB and MVA lo uh, Demo Local DB Log. We'll see that this is going to be for data rows and this is going to be for transaction log items. We'll see it's creating a default primary file group. We can specify our initial size in megabytes. So let's just go 500, for example, and an initial size for the log. I'm not going to do a lot with this database, so I don't need a lot of storage to record changes. We can, if we want, get into auto growth settings. Uh, we'll talk more about those in other courses. And then finally, we can choose where we want um, these files to go. And I don't want them to go under C program files. So I'll go ahead and select that folder that I showed you earlier, which on, was on my C drive, uh, SQL data. And this is going to go in the data folder. And my log is going to go in my logs folder. And because I'm working on a laptop that only has a single drive, I really can't show you best practices such as putting the data file or files and the transaction log on separate disks or separate uh, units in a SAN. Uh, this is as close as I can get, but it'll help sort of plant that seed that we want our databases and our logs uh, in, in separate locations for, for performance and uh, to some extent for fault tolerance. All right, and then finally I'll be asked to give these names, and if I leave it blank, it'll just name it after the, the, uh, the logical name, so I'm simply going to leave it blank. And at this point, again, I could review other options and uh, to add file groups for adding additional files. Um, I won't do that for this particular database. If I'm ready to go, I can just click OK, but before I do that, let me go ahead and tell this to take what I've done here and script this out to a new window. So that when I click OK, while we're waiting for the engine to build that database, we can go and review what instructions it was just given. So there's my T-SQL, create this database. And that primary file group is going to be that file called mvalocaldb.mdf on my C SQL data data folder. Same idea with the log, the initial settings I'd created. And then all of those other options that we don't have the opportunity to get into right now. But we've now got a database. I'm going to close this without saving because I know I had asked the management studio to create that for me. And I would expect now to see my database here in the list of database. And sure enough, there is MVA demo local DB. And we'll see in SSMS here, Management Studio, the, con the, the containers here where we'll then be able to get in and do things like add tables and so forth, which we'll get into later in this course. So in this part of the demo, we've gone ahead and created a brand new database. We can connect to that database and st start uh, writing queries with it adding objects, 
and we'll get into those things as the course goes on. All right, fantastic. So you've uh, you've shown us how to uh, get a, get started with the database at least. Yep. Um, I, I guess what we probably want to do is just recap some of the key points that we've we've covered in this. Sure. Okay. What are we talk about. Well, uh, the first thing we said was that databases are used to store data in tables. So we this idea of, of normalizing those tables out. Um, so we we normalize them to create a relational schema for the database. The tables are stored on disk. Um, there's all sorts of, of weird and wonderful stuff happening underneath that. We talk about pages being stored on disk, but fundamentally the, the tables are stored on disk and they're managed in something called a database server. And client applications will access that database server across a network, typically. Increasingly, uh, that database server, rather than being what we call on-premise, is in the cloud. We, we, we see them hosted in cloud services like Microsoft Azure. And the access to that database is generally restricted using a combination of firewalls to prevent individual machines from accessing it that shouldn't access it, and authentication to make sure that the, the users who are accessing it are sure. authenticated. And we'll talk more about configuring firewalls and authentication and even beyond that into authorization and encryption and all sorts of good security stuff later in the course. Exactly. Well, welcome back. We're uh, in module two, and we're going to now start looking at working with tables in our database. So that should, that should be interesting. Let's, let's have a look at that. Let's go. So we'll start by looking at how we create a table. And most operations that we do in, in a database, we do using a, a language called SQL. And uh, we're going to do this using a, a SQL statement. And it's the create table statement, unsurprisingly. So we're creating a table. And uh, the, the table name in this case, we're giving it a name. And it's in two, the name's in two parts. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, the two parts include the schema, which is really a container that holds the table itself, and then the name of the table. So sales is our schema, and product will be the name of the table. Uh, we can put other objects inside the same schema. Uh, related tables can all be in that sales schema, for example. We'll talk more later about things like views and stored procedures. They can all be stored in a schema. So it gives us a way to organize and then later uh, use for a security wrapper as well. All right, so it's a sort, of, a sort of namespace, but also something I can use as an encapsulator right. for security. All right, so we're creating this, this table. Now, when I create the table, you can see the, the diagrams appeared above there. There's a table now. It's a fairly amorphous thing because a table consists of columns. So actually, we need to start defining the columns that are in that table. So in this case, I'm defining a column called product ID. Each column has a data type. So what's the type of data I can store in that column? And in this case, I've said this is an integer column. So whole numbers only in this column. It's a special kind of column called identity. Uh, and what that means is it's going to automatically increment the value in that column. So, so you'll quite often see this used as a way of generating a unique key for a, a row in a table. So we've got an identity column. And we've explicitly said this is the primary key for this table. In other words, this is the, the column. The value in this uniquely identifies each row in the table. And only one column can have that identity property, right? A try, yeah. Within a given table. And, and similarly, only one column can be the primary key unless you've got a, a composite of, of multiple keys. But you can't have different columns that are each the primary key. Yeah, there's only one primary key. It consists of one or more columns, I guess, is the way to think about sure. it. You could combine columns to make a primary key. So we've got our, our product ID column. The, the next column we're going to create, we're, we're going to create something called a name column. And it's of type varcar20. Now, let's, let's kind of interpret that a little bit. Varcar? Varying with characters. Varying with characters. So in other words, it's, it's a string value. It's a right. string of characters, and it, it, it can vary. Some some of them maybe only have some people might or some products in this case might have names that are only five characters long. Sure. They can have any number of characters up to twenty. Up to 20. Specify right. a maximum. And then we got this um, this column called price, which was specified as a decimal value, and I've also included the word null there. So tell me a little bit about nulls. Well, in this case, that allows the column to be null, which is to say we may not supply a price for one of the rows. Uh, and that may be because we don't know what it is or because it doesn't have a price. Right. So we're, we're basically saying we're not enforcing there being a, an explicit right. value in this column. We can have a null value that says either there is no price or we don't know what the price right. is. So we create our, our, our table with these, uh, these three columns there. We've got our, our product ID, our name, and our price. And what I might want to do is, after I've created it, I might want to alter that table 
and perhaps add an, an additional column. So we've got this create table statement to create a table, and an alter table statement is used to, to modify the definition of a table. We're not modifying the data in the table, we're modifying the table itself. So I'm altering the table, and in this case, I'm adding another column called supplier. It's an integer column that doesn't allow nulls explicitly. We're not allowing nulls in that column. And I'm also adding something called a constraint. And constraints are something you, you'll come across quite often in databases. They are rules that we apply to a particular column. So in this case, I'm saying the constraint is that this column has a default value of 1. So whenever I try to insert a value into this table, if I don't specify a value for the price column, which allows nulls, then we'll end up with a null there. If I don't supply a value for the supplier column, which doesn't allow nulls, but does have a default value, then we'll get the default value of 1. That makes sense? Sure. So if we don't know the value, something will be supplied for us. Exactly, yeah. Now we've looked at create table, we've looked at alter table. The, the final thing you might want to think about is, hey, I made a big mistake, I don't need that table at all. I can drop that table. And the, the, the way you drop a table is drop table. Don't get mixed up with drop and delete. Right. Delete is used to delete data in a table. Drop is used to delete a table, to drop a table from the database. So we've got create and alter and drop. Yeah. Collectively, those are data definition language, right? Exactly. DDL. DDL we'll quite often right. talk about, yeah. So a couple of points that we've made then, just to, to kind of reiterate then, you create tables using the create table statement. You specify the name and the column specifications for the columns that are in that, that table. You can modify a table definition using the alter table statement. You use that to add or remove columns, constraints, keys, that type of thing. And we can remove tables by using the drop table statement, and that just removes that table from the database. So. Now, if, if there's data in a table and I drop the table, what happens to that data? You lose the data. So we've got to be really careful about dropping tables. Exactly, yeah. You have to be very careful with that. Is there an undo in SQL Server? Not for dropping tables, no. You guess you'd, uh, you'd have to restore from a backup, which right. is usually the, uh, the answer to that, that right. particular problem. All right, so we talked a little bit about creating uh, tables then. Let's, let's turn our attention, once we've got these tables, need, we obviously need to get some data into them. So let's, uh, let's perhaps look at that. All right, sure. Okay. Well, we'll go back to our um, idea of uh, working with, with data and tables, and we'll go back to our SQL language that we use for doing this. So here's my table. Now, earlier on, I, I put some sort of italicized values in there just to really show what type of data went in them. In reality, if we just created a table, it's, it's empty. There's nothing in the table. So if I want to insert some data into that, you'll be amazed to learn. That the, Is there an insert command? There's an insert command. So we actually do insert into the table and I can insert the values in that table here where we're just simply specifying that we are, uh, we're inserting these values and we're, we're just using the location in the, in, in the values clause there to correlate with the position of the, the column in the table. Notice I haven't specified anything for product ID. You remember that? Ah, that was the identity column. So exactly. that's been an auto number. Exactly. So the, the, when it's an identity column, that's the kind of exception to the rule. You don't have to specify a value for that. And what we've done is specify the values for the other columns. So we've specified the name column, the price column, and the supplier column, and we've given those values. We've inserted a widget at 12.99 into there. Do the, do the order of those values matter? It will because that correlates to the, um, the, because we haven't specified which columns we're inserting into, it has to go with the order that the columns are in the table. And what we can do is specify explicitly which columns we're inserting, in which case we can do it in any order we like, which is say we're inserting into the name, price, and supplier column these values. Now, they happen to be in the same order, but they don't have to be in this case. And if you left out any column names from the insert list, what happens? Well, that's, that's where it gets interesting. You might remember we, we had the idea of our um, price there that su supported nulls and our supplier that had a default value. So in this case, I've just inserted into name. I haven't specified anything for product ID because that's an identity. I haven't specified anything for price, and I haven't specified anything for supplier. So we insert the name knickknack, but then in our price column, we get a null because that column allows nulls and we haven't specified anything else to go in there. And in our supplier column, it doesn't allow nulls, but it does have a default value. So we get the default value of one appearing in there. So the rule is if there's a default, you'll get the default. If not, and it supports nulls, you'll get a null. If it doesn't support nulls, you'll get an error at that point. So if I do something like insert into uh, product, in this case, I'm explicitly saying null and default. I can do it that way as well. If I know I want to insert null and default. But if I do something like insert into product, something like that where the data type's not right, so I've said I want, it, I want this thing to be free, and I've inserted that as a string, then I get an error, because sure. it's the wrong data type. We need a zero there instead of the word free. Exactly. 
and this time I've, I've inserted a, 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 a zero there, but I've specified null for the supplier, and supplier doesn't support a null value. So I get an error in that instance as well. And that seems to make sense because we need to know what the relationship is to the supplier table for that row. So we can't just leave it out. Exactly. We need yeah. to know who that supplier is. Yeah. So we can use these, these constraints that we place upon the, the columns in the table to enforce some sort of integrity in the, in the data. It just prevents us from doing stupid things like inserting products that don't have suppliers. All right, well, we've inserted some data into this table. I guess the next thing we want to do is get some, some data out of it. So let's, let's take a look at that. And the way that we do that is with this idea of a select statement. So we've got select. In this case, I've said select star. What's that about? That means I want all of the columns. Right. So it's shorthand for saying just bring me back all of the columns in the database. And because I haven't filtered on the rows either, effectively what I'm doing is bringing back all of the data in that table. And that's okay for a teaching example, but do I want to do that in my applications? I suspect you don't. Um, as your tables get larger and as you're accessing this thing over a network, you, you don't want to be bringing back data unnecessarily. So usually we would advise people don't use select star unless it's a very small table or you're just, you know, you're testing things out. Typically you'll specify the specific columns that you want. Specify the specific columns. There you go. Um, have to talk about tautology. So we're, we're, we're getting the product ID, the name and the price from the product table in this case. And in my results set underneath, that's exactly what I get. I get those columns. And the order in which I list them in the select clause determines the order in which they come back, right? E exactly, yeah. Now, in this case, there's something interesting going on. I've brought back the, uh, the name product, but I've specified bring back name as product. So I'm giving it a different name in the result set. Notice in the result set, the column is called product, even though the original column is called name. Mm -hmm. And similarly, for the price, I'm not just bringing back the price. I'm bringing back the price times 0 0.9, multiply by 0 0.9. In other words, take 10% off, and that's going to be my sale price. Well, so we'll have to check with the manager. <laughs> yeah, we may have to check that. I've got permission to do that. But notice that it's gone ahead and it's multiplied the price. Where there is a price, it's multiplied it by 0 0.9 and give me that value. Where the price is null, well, anything multiplied by null is null. An unknown value divided by 10 is unknown, so we get null. And interestingly, that's, it's null. It's not an error. No, it's not it's an not error. It's not like I'm doing an operation on yeah. zero. Yeah, but the, the default behavior, and you, you can change this if you go into the settings, but the default behavior is that a null, uh, if you do an operation on a null, any operation with a null results in null. Which makes sense, you know, the, 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 the price I don't know multiplied by 10 is right. something I don't know. Now in this case, I'm applying a where clause, and that's a new thing we're introducing in the select statement at, at this point to, to show how we would filter the rows. We've seen how to specify the, the columns I want. In this case, I'm also filtering on the rows. So bring me back only the products where the supplier is supplier to. And that's um, how, how we do that. And one of the things that you'll need to get used to and that's something we cover in more depth in our T-SQL MBA and some mm. of our other T-SQL courses, is the order in which uh, the database engine is interpreting that statement. And so learning that it looks at the from clause and then it applies the where filter before it uh, then selects the columns um, starts to help you understand as these statements get more and more complex mm. what the output's going to be. But we'll keep it small now. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's an underlying engine, the, the query engine that interprets the SQL you type. The SQL actually is, is fairly, it, it, I think it's quite intuitive. It's, it's, it's a syntax that's, you know, you could read that and pretty much know what it does, sure. even if you've never done any SQL before. But that's not necessarily what gets interpreted under the right. covers by the query engine. So some key points we've covered then. Uh, we, we insert data into a table using the insert statement. And when we do that, we can either specify explicit columns um, or we can um, support defaults or nulls and, and insert into those, those values. We can select data from uh, a table using the select statement. And we do that by specifying the columns or expressions. We had some calculations in there that we, could, we can use and that brings back what we, we want to get in our result set. We can use aliases or alternative names, if you like, for the, the columns in the result set. We use that as clause to do that. And we can filter rows using the where clause to bring back only the rows that satisfy that, that filter criteria. Mm -hmm. So you've got some demos of this to show us, right? I have indeed. Let's, let's go and take a look at creating a table in SQL Server. So here we are in SQL Server Management Studio. I've got a, a SQL Server 2016 virtual machine in Azure here. And I'm working in a sample database. It's called the AdventureWorks 2016 database. It's a, a, a sample database that you can download to experiment with, uh, with SQL Server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a table. And you can see the syntax here. It's create table. 
and I've got this DBO dot customer. Now the, the DBO dot is the, the schema or the namespace, if you like, where I want to create this, this table. So I'm, I'm giving it a fully qualified name or at least a partially qualified name here of the, the schema and then the actual table name. So it's a table called customer that's in this thing called a schema called DBO. And the customer table is going to consist of a number of columns. We've got a, a customer ID column, which is going to store integer data. And it's a special kind of column. It's an identity column. So it's going to automatically increment a value with each new row that's added to the table. And it's the primary key for the table. It's, it's the, the, the column that uniquely identifies each row in the table. So a customer ID will uniquely identify a customer row. We've then got a first name. And that's of type nvarcar. Uh, so in other words, it's going to support um, Unicode characters um, for my, my names. And I'm going to have a maximum length of 20 characters for someone's first name. And you'll see that that's specifically set to be not null. So I can't not put a value in this column. I can't leave that, that value uh, null. I have to put in a first name. I've then got middle name, which again is an nvarcar of 20 characters. But this time, I'm allowing nulls. So if someone doesn't have a middle name, then, you know, in, in theory, we can just leave that null. And the same with last name. We've got um, a, a, an nvarcar 20. And again, I'm allowing null. Some people don't have last names. They just have a first name. So um, we, we'll, we'll leave that null. It should be worth thinking about here that null could mean either this person doesn't have a, a middle name or last name, or it could just mean we don't know what the middle name or last name is. Null means unknown, effectively. We've got an account opened. Um, column here, which is a date. So we're recording the date that this customer opened their account. And in that one, we're assigning a default value of the current date. We're using this getDate function to calculate today's date. Um, so if I don't specify, when I insert a value into here, if I don't specify when the account was opened, it will default to the value for the current date. And then I've got a credit limit uh, that I'm going to um, assign to that. It's going to be a decimal value, and that's going to have a uh, six values in, in the, the number uh, to two decimal places. So we've got this um, spe specified um, decimal size that we're, uh, we're going to store in there. And again, we've got a default value of 1,000. So we're going to allow a default credit limit of 1,000. So that's the code to create the table. Let's go ahead and run that. I'll just select the, this particular statement, which is what I want to execute. And we'll go ahead and execute that. And off that goes. The command completed successfully, it tells me. So that's, that's good news. And if I go and have a look in my uh, database here, in my AdventureWorks 2016 database at tables, um, I should find in here, I might just have to refresh this view, that we have a DBO customer table. So there's that table. And I can see the columns that I've defined in that table. So it's gone off and it's created that table for me in my database. All right, so I'm now ready to do some work with that, um, that table. Let's uh, scroll down and have a look at some more code here. And the first thing I might want to do is I might want to insert uh, a row into that table. So I'm going to insert a new customer. So I'm inserting into the dbo.customer table these values. So I haven't specified any individual columns. I'm just saying insert into the table these values. And the values are in the order that the columns appear. Now, you might notice I haven't specified a customer ID. Because remember that that was uh, an identity column. So that's automatically going to be generated for me. Uh, but I am inserting the first name, the middle name, or the middle initial in this case, the last name, the um, account opened date, and the credit limit. So I'm explicitly entering the values for those columns other than the identity one, which is, is generated automatically for me. So we'll go ahead and select that. And off that goes, it says one row affected. So it's inserted that one row into the table now, which is, is good news for me. Well, let's look at some other ways of inserting data. In, in this case, we're going to insert some explicit nulls, and we're going to use some default values. So we're inserting into the, the DBO customer table again. Um, and again, we're just inserting the values. But this time, I'm saying that the, the first name is Rodrigo. There is no middle name. So I'm explicitly saying the middle name is null. Right? I'm explicitly saying there's nothing to be inserted in there. The last name is Romani. And then I want to insert the default value for the account open date and the default value for the credit limit. And remember, I specified what those defaults should be when I created the table. So I can go ahead and run that. And again, one row affected, it's inserted that row into the table. Well, the other thing I can do, because I've got columns that allow null values and I've got some default values specified for some of the columns, 
I don't have to insert something into every single column. I don't have to create these placeholder values to insert into the, the columns that accept nulls or defaults. I can just say I want to insert into DBO customer and then specify these are the columns that I'm inserting. I'm only inserting first name and last name. If there are any other columns, just use either a null if it supports nulls or a default if there's a default defined for that column. So let's insert Naomi Sharp into there. And again, that succeeds. One row affected that's happily done that. And because I haven't specified things like the, the middle name or the account open date or the credit limit, it's used either a null or a default value for those. Now let's insert something that I know to be invalid. I'm going to insert a null first name and a middle initial and a last name and then a date and a credit limit. Now we, we specifically said that first names could not be null. So what happens if I try to insert a null into that location? Well, what happens is I get this error message you're hearing. It says you cannot insert the value null into column first name. Um, that statement has been terminated because we don't allow null first names. So here's a, a question for you, um, just to see if you've been uh, paying attention here. We created the table and we specified that there is a default value for the credit limit. But I did not say whether or not it would also allow nulls. So if we have a look at our create table statement, here it is here. Here's my credit limit column. Credit limit is a decimal value with a default of a thousand. But I haven't said null or not null. I've, I've left that ambiguous. And whether or not that's going to allow nulls depends on the settings that I have for the database. So until I actually run this, unless, unless I explicitly know what the settings are for the database, I don't know whether this is going to succeed or fail. So if I run that, it actually succeeds. So the default in my database system is that columns will allow nulls. If I haven't specified null or not null, it will allow nulls. But I can change that behavior in the database. So you shouldn't rely on that. The point is that you should always be explicit when you're creating tables about whether you want to allow null values or not. OK, so I've, I've created my um, database. I've put all these rows, I've created my table rather. I've put all these rows into the table. Um, I might want to actually get the, the data back out of the, uh, the table. So let's go ahead and run this select statement. And it's going to select star from DBO customer. Star is the kind of shorthand for just bring me back everything that's in this um, table. Bring me back all of the columns is really what that means. So if I run that, sure enough, it brings back everything that's in there. And I can see those values. It's generated these identity values, one, two, three, uh, five, because you remember there was one statement that I tried to insert that failed. So we, we, we tried to insert four, that failed, and it just moves on to the next number. So we get to five. And I've got my, my first names all in there. Where there's a null, I can see that it's highlighted. That's a null value in there. So it's not that the middle name is actually null. Um, it's actually a, a null value that's in there. And I've got a null credit limit here in that last row that we, we inserted as well. Now I can bring back, rather than bring back all of the columns, it's kind of wasteful to do that. If you're doing this over a network and you've got a table with lots of columns, you probably don't want to bring them all back. You just bring back the columns that you're interested in. So I can specify that I only want the customer ID, the first name, and the last name from this table. So let's go ahead and run that. And sure enough, it brings back just the customer ID, first name, and last name. So I get that, that data. That's pretty good stuff. I can also do things like I can bring back calculated columns. So I've got a couple of different things going on here. I'm selecting the customer ID, and then I'm selecting the first name plus a space plus the last name as the full name. So the plus in this case, because these things are strings, these are NVARCAR columns, it's going to treat this plus as a way of concatenating strings together. So it's going to be the first name and a space and the last name as the full name. Now the as really just gives a name to the column that gets re returned. Because that's a calculation, it wouldn't actually have a, a column name when it gets brought back in the results down here. So we're giving it a name of full name. And then there's another uh, calculation in here. I'm using a function called date diff, which measures in days. That's what the DD is. So date diff in days between the account opened and today's date. So in other words, how many days has the account been open for? And I'm going to call that account days. So don't worry too much about the details of the, the function. We're not really worried too much about that at this point. But what we're looking at here is we can have a select statement that involves not just specifying columns, but I can specify calculations on those columns and effectively create, derive new columns in the result that come back. So let's go and run that. And sure enough, it brings back my customer ID, the full name, which is the first name plus a space plus the last name. 
and the number of days that that account has been opened. And of course, uh, Rodrigo and Naomi here just used the default value for opening their account, which was today, so there, there haven't been any days between when it opened and today, so that's a zero. Now, I, what I've been doing so far is bringing back all of the, the rows. I'm bringing back specific columns, individual columns, but I'm bringing back all of the rows. I can actually filter the, the rows that come back as well as the columns. I can specify just bring me back the customer ID, first name, last name, and credit limit from the DBO customer table where the credit limit is greater than 500. So bring me back only the rows where the customer has a credit limit of greater than 500. That's what that where clause does, that adds a filter. And if I do that, I can see that I've only got two customers who have a credit limit of greater than 500, and that's Rodrigo and Naomi who have that default credit limit of 1,000. So that wraps up the demo for looking at creating tables. It's very simple. We've seen how to create a table. We've seen how to insert some rows into that table, and then how to use a select statement to bring back data out of the table. So hopefully that's useful. All right, welcome back. Yeah, let's talk about data types. Yeah, indeed. So um, you saw that we, we created some tables there, and we, we created tables that had columns of particular data types. Those data types can be different, obviously, types of data. So one type of data might be character strings, so where you've got text, effectively. So we could have fixed length character strings. A phone number is a good example where you might want to specify a fixed length. Mm -hmm. You could have variable length. We, we talked about variable length. So right. there's varchar and nvarchar types that we, we've, we've seen. Um, You've got large bodies of text, so you know maybe the equivalent of a, a document that you, you want to store. Technically, under the covers, it's stored slightly differently. It's not actually stored in the table. What you get in the table is a pointer to where that, that data is stored. But we can store large volumes of text. And we've got this idea of, of storing Unicode values. So where we've had var car for, for variable length, we've got n var car for, for um, supporting character sets that aren't necessarily in the regular ASCII. So anytime I've seen that n and an apostrophe in front of a data type or, or a, uh, a string, that means it's that Unicode. It's a Unicode right. value, yeah. Now, as well as strings, we can store numbers. So um, some of the numbers we've seen, you can store integers, whole numbers, in other words. And there are different sizes of integer. You can specify a, a tiny int, a small int, a large int. Don't worry too much about the details of, of the, the, the specific size limits. But you can be efficient in your storage by specifying the, the maximum size of integer you want to store. But you also want to plan ahead. You do want to plan you ahead. You want to think about what the largest number you might need to store is. Yeah. Uh, we can store exact decimals, precise decimals, to a, a specific precision and scale. And we can also store approximate decimals, so floating point decimals, where you might get the odd rounding error depending on um, wh wh how you calculate that. So you've got this, this option for storing these different types of numbers. We can store temporal values. So if we, we need to deal with, with dates, dates and, and times. times, actually, that's a really common thing in databases. So sure. you can store dates, you can store times, and you can store date and time. So we've got the, you know, things like an order date at the precise point during the day when that, that order was placed. And we can even store things like offsets. So if we know that we, we've got a meeting time for an international calendar application, perhaps, that we're building, we can offset it from, uh, you know, in this case, perhaps UTC. So you're, you're offsetting it from the time in the Greenwich Mean Time in, in London. Now, about the birth date, hmm. that first birth date, 1971-03-07, hmm. is that March 7th or is that July 3rd? So that is March 7th. I've, I've specifically chosen a format that's, that's a, a kind of recognized format because different countries do things differently. If you do it this way, you do the, the year, then the month, and the day, right. then two things happen. One is everybody can agree that that's the format. The other thing is that actually, if you were to sort that in alphabetical order, it's going to be in the right order because it's year, then month, and day. Right. And there are some other data types. There's more esoteric data types that you can store. So we, we've got things like bit for true false values. Um, we've got binary where you can store the, the binary that's perhaps encoding a photograph or a video or something like that. Um, there's something called a unique identifier, a GUID, sometimes you'll see it called mm -hmm. a global unique identifier we can store. We can store XML. We, we've got a data type that supports um, XML. We'll talk a little bit about that in one of the later right. modules. And similarly, we can store spatial data, so um, coordinates or shapes, geometrical right. shapes using spatial data. And then there's this the idea of a timestamp. It's timestamp is actually an integer value since sometime in the 70s. I can't remember exactly when it was, like in the 70s or something. But there's there's a specific date that's that's regularly used, right. quite often used in Unix systems as a, a, a timestamp. So the key points we've covered then, um, you're going to choose the most appropriate data type and size for your column. And you're going to have to think about 
the um, as you say, the, the size eventually you might right. end up storing in there. So the biggest size you're going to need and the appropriate data type, whether it's a string or a number or whatever. You are also going to um, have data types. Some of them can be implicitly converted. So for example, if I tell SQL Server to do an operation that multiplies an integer by a, a decimal number, that will quite happily work. They're both numbers. And if I tell it to insert a string that's actually consisting of numbers into a numerical column, that will that will work because SQL Server will say, well, you obviously meant that to be a number, right. I'll just convert it. But sometimes it won't be able to convert because it doesn't know what you mean. If you try and multiply a date by a, a string, that doesn't make any sense. So SQL Server will throw an error at that sure. point. And we can explicitly convert that using some built-in functions. Exactly, right. yeah. There's functions in SQL Server to do that. Well, why don't I uh, go and show you uh, some, some examples of working with data types so we can see some of this in action. Sounds good. Let's see a demo. Well, here we are back in SQL Server Management Studio. And previously, we saw how to create a table. And we're going to create another table now. And I just want to pay a little bit more attention to the data types of the columns in this table. So we're creating a, a table called dbo.accountmanagers. Uh, the first column is the employee ID that identifies each of my um, account manager employees. And that's an integer. So it's a whole number that I'm creating there. Then I've got a first name, which is a varchar. A variable length character is what varchar means. And um, because it's var and not n varchar, what we're saying is this supports the ASCII character set. So um, that, that kind of uh, standard set of, of English language characters that, that can be stored in that. Then we've got a, a last name column which supports n varchar. So again, it's a variable length character, it's a string, but this time, because of the n at the beginning, we're supporting Unicode or wide characters. So that, that more um, extended character set that supports um, some characters that might exist in, in languages other than English. So perhaps kanji characters or something like that. We've got the date of birth, which is a date. Now, there are various different ways of storing um, temporal values. You can have dates and date time, which would store the date and the time. This is specifically just the date uh, for the date of birth. And we've got a salary which has um, a, a decimal um, value in here. So we're storing a decimal value in here that has um, the, uh, 10 um, digits supported altogether with two decimal places. So it's going to be accurate to, to two decimal places with 10 um, digits. So let's go ahead and run that create table statement. And that creates my, uh, my table. And we'll insert some values into the account manager. So I'm inserting into here um, Lucas Sondergaard. And you can see that there are, there are some characters in here. These are actually regular ASCII characters, so it wouldn't matter if it was varchar or, or nvarchar. But just to make the point, we can insert um, different characters into here. And um, I've got my, my date in here. And look, the date is actually in quotes. I'm treating it like a string. So I've got 1971-03-07, which is the uh, 1971. The next thing is the month. So that's March 7th, 1971. And the um, salary that I'm putting in there is 92,000. So let's go ahead and insert that. And that all works as expected. We, we get our row inserted into the table. Well, let's have a look at Rosie Reeves. We're going to insert Rosie Reeves into here. And this time, the, the date format's slightly different. I've got 12-12-1988. So it's in a different format, but SQL Server will still recognize that as a date. And I've got my um, value here, which is a decimal, but I've, I've left off the decimal places here. So it's just a, a whole number that I've put. So I've actually entered an integer, is really what I've done there. But it can be treated as a decimal. We just assume that it's 0 0.00 that's going to go on the end of that. So I go ahead and do that, and that inserts that quite happily. Well, here's another one. This time I'm going to try and insert Deanna. And instead of a last name, I've actually put a number here. We're going to assume that Deanna has a, a last name that's actually a number, 8411. And we'll see what happens if we try and insert that. And actually, that succeeds. So we've got this number here. You might have been expecting that to fail and throw an error, but it doesn't because all that happens is SQL Server says, well, you've missed out the quotes, but I'm just going to treat that as a string. So I'm going to take in that as a string of characters. I can't do any calculations with it because it's not actually going to store um, a number in the table, it's going to store the string 8411. It'll treat it as a, 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 an end var car in this case. So here's another thing. I'm going to insert into um, my account managers uh, Aisha Witt, and I've got a date there. And notice that I've got the number here, the, the uh, salary, but I've prefixed it with a dollar symbol. So I've actually put the symbol for, uh, for the, the currency that I'm putting in there, and we might expect that to fail because that's not technically a number. I've put a bit of a character in there. 
but actually it's quite happy with that. Uh, SQL Server recognizes that as being a symbol that goes with numbers, so it just treats it as a decimal uh, number. Now let's try and get a little more creative. I'm going to insert into here Elwood McGee with a date, and this time I've specified the salary as a string with the dollar symbol. So I've got I've put it in quotes, so it treats it like a, a varchar um, value there, and I've put the dollar symbol in there. Now so far it's accepted uh, numbers where we should be storing strings. Let's see if it will accept a string where we want to store a number. And in this case it fails. It says I can't convert the data type varchar to numeric. So because we've got that as a string value in there, and we're trying to insert it into a numeric column, it's a decimal column, uh, SQL Server at that point says, well, no, that, that, that doesn't fit into that column, so there's an error there. Well, let's, let's try and be a little bit more clever. Let's try and insert it as a string, but this time we won't include the dollar symbol. So we've inserted it without the quotes with the dollar symbol, and that worked. We've tried to insert it with quotes and a dollar symbol, and that didn't work. If we had tried to insert a string value, but we're not, we're only including numbers in that string, only numerals, we haven't got any uh, symbols in there. Well, let's see what's going to happen. I'm just going to try and select that properly. There we go. And we'll run that. And that actually works. So again, SQL Server automatically does the conversion for me. It knows that this thing is meant to be a number. It has a look at what's in the string. It doesn't find anything odd. It doesn't find any strange symbols. So it just goes ahead and converts it. So sometimes you'll get perhaps slightly unexpected behavior when SQL Server automatically does these conversions of data types. And again, I'm going to insert into my um, value here, I'm going to insert Zachary Fellows. And the date format here is 37-1978. Now, you can probably tell from my accent that where I come from, that's a perfectly valid date. That's the 30th of July, 1978. But because my instance of SQL Server has been set up as if it were in the United States, it obeys all the rules for United States formatting for dates. And in the US, we do things the other way around. We have the month and then the day. So actually, I would have to change that to, 30, to, to 7 slash 30 in order to say the 30th of July. So um, there is some, some consideration that you have to make when it comes to how you format things like dates. It, it, it might be dependent on the region that your, uh, your SQL Server is set up to support. And we'll just go ahead just to, to verify that all that data is now in there. If I go and bring back all of the rows from that table, I can see all of that data is in there. I can see that the dates are, are given to me in that standard sort of format here where you've got the uh, year, then the month, and the day. That's the default that gets displayed when we bring that back. Now, I could do things like try and bring back the employee ID plus the salary. You might remember previously we, we um, did a query where we concatenated some strings together. This time, we're using the plus symbol, but we've got two numeric columns here. I've got an integer employee ID and a decimal salary. So the query itself is nonsensical. We're adding the employee ID to the salary, but it will actually work because these two things are numbers. So it can add two numbers together. If I use the same thing with first name and last name, where the two things are, are character data, they're not numbers. Again, it works, but this time the plus is used to do something different. It's used to concatenate, so it concatenates the first name to the last name. Well, what happens if I try and add the first name and the salary? This time, one of these things is a character, one of these things is a number. So let's have a, a look at that. And this time we get an error. It doesn't concatenate it, it doesn't add it, we just get an error that says, hey, look, you've, you've tried to do an operation involving a var car and a, a numeric, and what it's, it's trying actually to do is, is to treat it as an addition. It's saying, well, you know, we can't convert the data type var car to numeric. You've tried to add a string to a number, and it, I'm not going to support that. I'm not going to allow that. What if I try date of birth to employee ID? Date of birth is a date. Employee ID is an integer. Let's try that. And again, I get an operand type clash. Slightly different error, but date is incompatible with int. Right, so these two things are, are not compatible data types. What if I try and add first name and date of birth? So this time a string and a date. And again, I get uh, an error that says the var the date the types var car and date are incompatible in the add operator. So it's trying to add them, um, and it's not able to do that because of those data types. So. Really what we've done here is we've just taken a look at some of the things just to be aware of when you're, you're specifying the data types for the columns in your tables. Sometimes SQL Server will automatically convert between different data types if it makes sense to do so. Other times 
it might throw an error because you're trying to do something that's, that's ambiguous or it's, it's incompatible to try and add strings and numbers or, or that type of thing. So be very aware when you choose the data types for your column that you choose an appropriate data type for the data that you're going to store there and for the operations that you're going to perform on it. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about multiple tables. Sure, yeah. So we've, we've seen how we can work with uh, one, one table. We've, we've seen that working quite happily. Let's look at what happens when you've got multiple tables in the database and you need to query and, and work with, with more than one table. So we've got our product table. We've been looking at this example all the way through, and here it is. And I've got that supplier column. The supplier is an integer value that identifies the supplier. And of course, really, that would be there would be a separate table of suppliers. So we can create a table called supplier that has an integer ID as its uh, primary key and it has a name and a phone number. So we, there we've got our, our supplier table there. And what we're trying to do is make sure that the values that go in our product table match suppliers that are in the supplier table. So when I insert into my supplier table some values there, I get my, my suppliers being quite happily added to there. You'll notice that I've got suppliers numbers one, two, and three. And in my um, product table, I've got existing products that are mapped to suppliers one and two. So all is, all is good in there, and that's all fine, that works. What I want to do is I want to make sure that I can't insert a product with an invalid supplier. So I'm going to alter my product table and I'm going to add a constraint. And this time the constraint is something called a foreign key constraint. And what it's doing is it's saying the supplier column in this table is the foreign key that references the primary key in another table. It pref right. re references the primary key in the supplier table. So whatever goes in this supplier column in this product table must match a value that's already in the supplier table. Now, if you run this and you've got existing data in the product table and some of that doesn't have a matching supplier number, what happens? Well, I, I can specify an override. I can specify whether I want to apply it to existing data and throw an error or just ignore existing data. So I actually get the option when I do that. What typically you might do is, is you, you might allow nulls um, so that you, you've got a kind of a workaround to say, right. hey, there's a null value in here. Now, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to insert some values into my product table. So I insert a new product, a Duda. And it's uh, 199, and it's from supplier number three. It's from a datum, and that's that's perfectly valid. I've got supplier number three. That's great. Now, if I try and insert something else in there, I'm going to insert a MacGuffin, and I'm going to reference supplier number five. But I'm going to get an error because there is no supplier number five. So I, I, I get an error thrown for that. So we're, we're applying what we call referential integrity. So do the other columns values get stored? Do we get a new row with MacGuffin in 299, and it just leaves out the five? It doesn't. We'll talk a little bit about transactions later on, but, but each time we insert just an individual statement, it's what we call an implicit transaction. SQL Server makes sure either the whole row gets inserted or nothing gets inserted. So if anything fails, nothing gets inserted. So let's look at the, uh, the, the key points we've, we've covered there then. Most databases, I think we saw the example of normalization at the beginning, most databases will have multiple tables as a direct result of that. And we use keys to determine the relationships between those tables. So a primary key uniquely identifies a row in, a, in an individual table. And you might use a foreign key that relates to the primary key in another table. So we, we can make that relationship between the two. And we can use foreign key constraints to enforce those rules, to prevent invalid data sections. And we, um, we, we prevent deletions as well and updates. So, so for example, what would happen if I had a supplier and I had products that came from that supplier and then I deleted the supplier. Well, that would leave some orphan products. Right. So I want to prevent that. Sure. That whole thing is generally referred to as referential integrity, the integrity that, between the references between tables. Right. All right, well, let's see what this stuff looks like. Let's uh, have a demo. Sure. Well, you might remember in a, a previous demo, we created a table called customer and we created another table called account manager. So if I go and refresh my list of tables here, uh, you can see there's my customer table and there's my account managers table. And the idea is that each account manager is responsible for managing one or more customers. So each customer will have an account manager assigned to them is another way of thinking of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a column to my customer table that tells me which account manager is the account manager for that customer. And I'm going to do it by adding an integer value. You might remember, if, if we look in the account managers table, here's a little shortcut for you. If I right click account managers here, I can go and select the top 1,000 rows just easily out of that. So we're going to do that. 
and it goes and generates the, the appropriate um, SQL for me. So I can see here the account managers I've got, and each account manager is identified by a unique employee ID. So I've got an integer value here that identifies each account manager. So what I'm going to do in my customers table, again, we'll just do the same thing with customer. Let's have a quick look at that. Each customer is also identified by a, a, an integer ID, but that's neither here nor there. There's nothing in this table that specifically says which account manager is, is associated with the customer. So we need to add a column to this table, basically. So we're going to do that by using this alter table statement. We're altering the table. We're adding a column called account manager, which is an integer. So it's going to be the integer value that is the employee ID of the account manager that this um, uh, customer is managed by. And I've added this um, value here. First of all, I'm saying that I'm going to allow null. So I'll allow the case where a customer doesn't have an employee ID, so, uh, an account manager associated with them. But when they do have, it will reference the account manager's table employee ID column. So in other words, the value that goes in here should match an employee ID that's in the account manager's table. So let's go and run that. And off it goes and happily completes that. And if I have another look at my um, customers table, we'll just go and run that select top thousand rows again. I've now got my account manager column. That's been added to the table, but the values are all null just now because I, I haven't inserted any uh, customer ID values into there. Well, let's go in and do that. We'll update the customer table and we'll set the account manager for all of my um, customers to one. So whoever uh, account manager number one is, they're going to be the account manager for all of the customers. And we'll just again go and verify that that's actually happened. So let's have a look. Yep, sure enough, account manager is set to one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new customer. So I've got a brand new customer in here. Um, this is uh, Rhonda Hughes. I'm adding her. And I'm specifying it when I insert the table, this last column here is the account manager column. And I'm specifying that this one has account manager number two. So if I go ahead and do that. Sure enough, we've got one row affected. We've inserted that table in there. And if I go and look at my uh, customer table here, sure enough, Rhonda Hughes is in there with account manager number two. And if I look at my account manager's table, we can even find out who that actually is. Employee number two is Rosie Reeves. So we know that Rosie Reeves is the account manager for Rhonda Hughes. All right, well, so far so good. What happens if I try to insert a new customer with a non-existent account manager. So we, we don't have an account manager. We don't have anybody with employee ID number nine. But we'll try and insert that into there. And actually, that fails. We get an error that says the insert statement conflicted with the foreign key constraint. Remember, when I altered the table, I specified that this has to reference the account manager's table employee ID column. That created this thing called a foreign key constraint. So the, the foreign key is the key in the customer's table that references the primary key in the account manager's table. And it says it violated, it conflicted with that foreign key constraint, and it occurred in that database, and the column was the employee ID column. So we've tried to insert a customer with an, uh, an account manager that doesn't exist in the uh, account manager's table. That is not allowed because of that constraint, so the statement is terminated and the customer is not inserted. So what we're really doing here is we're using foreign key constraints in order to enforce what we call referential integrity between the tables in my database, where I've got a value in one table that references a row in another table. We have referential integrity enforced here because of the constraints that prevents me from putting in a value in the, in the, the, the first table that references something that doesn't exist in the second table. So what have we learned? Well, that's a good question. Let's take a look at the slide and see what we've covered in this module. We actually covered quite a lot. We talked about using the create table statement to create tables. So we've, uh, we've seen how to do that. We've seen how to use the insert statement to add rows. We'll talk more about um, you know, inserting and working with data uh, later on. But we've seen the basics of inserting rows and using the select statement to get rows back out of the table. And uh, we've talked about the idea of using constraints that define the relationships between primary keys in one table and a foreign key in that table that references a primary key in another table. And that enforces referential integrity between those tables. Well, here we are back in SQL Server Management Studio. And previously, we saw how to create a table. And we're going to create another table now. And I just want to pay a little bit more attention to the data types of the columns in this table. So we're creating a, a table called dbo.accountmanagers. 
Uh, the first column is the employee ID that identifies each of my um, account manager employees. And that's an integer, so it's a whole number that I'm creating there. Then I've got a first name, which is a varchar, a variable length character is what varchar means. And um, because it's var and not in varchar, what we're saying is this supports the ASCII character set. So um, that, that kind of uh, standard set of, of English language characters that, that can be stored in that. Then we've got a, a last name column which supports n varchar. So again, it's a variable length character, it's a string, but this time because of the n at the beginning, we're supporting Unicode or wide characters. So that, that more um, extended character set that supports um, some characters that might exist in, in languages other than English. So perhaps kanji characters or something like that. We've got the date of birth, which is a date. Now there are various different ways of storing um, temporal values. You can have dates and date time, which would store the date and the time. This is specifically just the date uh, for the date of birth. And we've got a salary which has um, a, a decimal um, value in here. So we're storing a decimal value in here that has um, the, uh, 10 um, digits supported altogether with two decimal places. So it's going to be accurate to, to two decimal places with 10 um, digits. So let's go ahead and run that create table statement. And that creates my, uh, my table. And we'll insert some values into the account manager. So I'm inserting into here um, Lucas Sondergaard, and you can see that there are, there are some characters in here. These are actually regular ASCII characters, so it wouldn't matter if it was Varkar or, or NVarkar, but just to make the point, we can insert um, different characters into here. And um, I've got my, my date in here, and look, the date is actually in quotes. I'm treating it like a string, so I've got 1971-03-07, which is the uh, 1971. The next thing is the month, so that's March 7th, 1971. And the um, salary that I'm putting in there is 92,000. So let's go ahead and insert that. And that all works as expected. We, we get our row inserted into the table. Well, let's have a look at Rosie Reeves. We're going to insert Rosie Reeves into here. And this time, the, the date format's slightly different. I've got 12-12-1988. So it's in a different format, but SQL Server will still recognize that as a date. And I've got my um, value here, which is a decimal, but I've, I've left off the decimal places here. So it's just a whole number that I've put. So I've actually entered an integer is really what I've done there, but it can be treated as a decimal. We just assume that it's 0 0.00 that's gonna go on the end of that. So I go ahead and do that and that inserts that quite happily. Well, here's another one. This time I'm gonna try and insert Deanna and instead of a last name, I've actually put a number here. We're going to assume that Deanna has a, a last name that's actually a number, 8411. And we'll see what happens if we try and insert that. And actually, that succeeds. So we've got this number here. You might have been expecting that to fail and throw an error, but it doesn't because all that happens is SQL Server says, well, you've missed out the quotes, but I'm just going to treat that as a string. So I'm going to take in that as a string of characters. I can't do any calculations with it because it's not actually going to store... Um, a number in the table, it's going to store the string 8411. It'll treat it as a, 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 an n var car in this case. So here's another thing. I'm going to insert into um, my account managers uh, Aisha Witt, and I've got a date there. And notice that I've got the number here, the, the uh, salary, but I've prefixed it with a dollar symbol. So I've actually put the symbol for, uh, for the, the currency that I'm putting in there, and we might expect that to fail because that's not technically a number. I've put a bit of a character in there. But actually, it's quite happy with that. Uh, SQL Server recognizes that as being a symbol that goes with numbers, so it just treats it as a decimal uh, number. Now let's try and get a little more creative. I'm going to insert into here Elwood McGee with a date, and this time I've specified the salary as a string with the dollar symbol. So I've, got, I've put it in quotes, so it treats it like a, a, a var car um, value there, and I've put the dollar symbol in there. Now, so far, it's accepted uh, numbers where we should be storing strings. Let's see if it will accept a string where we want to store a number. And in this case, it fails. It says, I can't convert the data type varchar to numeric. So because we've got that as a string value in there, and we're trying to insert it into a numeric column, it's a decimal column, uh, SQL Server at that point says, well, no, that, that, that doesn't fit into that column, so there's an error there. Well, let's, let's try and be a little bit more clever. Let's try and insert it as a string, but this time we won't include the dollar symbol. So we've inserted it without the quotes with the dollar symbol, and that worked. We've tried to insert it with quotes and a dollar symbol, and that didn't work. If we had tried to insert a string value 
but we're not we're only including numbers in that string only numerals we haven't got any uh, symbols in there well let's see what's going to happen I'm just going to try and select that properly there we go and we'll run that and that actually works so again SQL Server automatically does the conversion for me it knows that this thing is meant to be a number it has a look at what's in the string it doesn't find anything odd it doesn't find any strange symbols so it just goes ahead and converts it so sometimes you'll get perhaps slightly unexpected behavior when SQL Server automatically does these conversions of data types and again I'm going to insert into my um, value here I'm going to insert Zachary Fellows and the date format here is 37 1978. Now you can probably tell from my accent that where I come from that's a perfectly valid date that's the 30th of July 1978. But because my instance of SQL Server has been set up as if it were in the United States it obeys all the rules for United States formatting for dates and in the US we do things the other way around we have the month and then the day so actually I would have to change that to 30 to, to 7 slash 30 in order to say the 30th of July. So um, there is some, some consideration that you have to make when it comes to how you format things like dates. It, it, it might be dependent on the region that your, uh, your SQL Server is set up to support. And we'll just go ahead just to, to verify that all that data is now in there. If I go and bring back all of the rows from that table, I can see all of that data is in there. I can see that the dates are, are given to me in that standard sort of format here where you've got the uh, year, then the month, and the day. That's the default that gets displayed when we bring that back. Now, I could do things like try and bring back the employee ID plus the salary. You might remember previously we, we um, did a query where we concatenated some strings together. This time, we're using the plus symbol, but we've got two numeric columns here. I've got an integer employee ID and a decimal salary. So the query itself is nonsensical. We're adding the employee ID to the salary, but it will actually work because these two things are numbers. So it can add two numbers together. If I use the same thing with first name and last name, where the two things are, are character data, they're not numbers, again, it works, but this time the plus is used to do something different. It's used to concatenate. So it concatenates the first name to the last name. Well, what happens if I try and add the first name and the salary? This time, one of these things is a character, one of these things is a number. So let's have a, a look at that. And this time we get an error. It doesn't concatenate it, it doesn't add it. We just get an error that says, hey, look, you've, you've tried to do an operation involving a var car and a, a numeric. And what it's, it's trying actually to do is, is to treat it as an addition. It's saying, well, you know, we can't convert the data type var car to numeric. You've tried to add a string to a number and it, I'm not gonna support that, I'm not gonna allow that. What if I try date of birth to employee ID? Date of birth is a date, employee ID is an integer. Let's try that. And again, I get an operand type class, slightly different error, but date is incompatible with int, right? So these two things are, are not compatible data types. What if I try and add first name and date of birth? So this time a string and a date. And again, I get uh, an error that says the var the date the types var car and date are incompatible in the add operator so it's trying to add them um, and it's not able to do that because of those data types so really what we've done here is we've just taken a look at some of the, the things just to be aware of when you're, you're specifying the data types for the columns in your tables sometimes sql server will automatically convert between different data types if it makes sense to do so other times it might throw an error because you're trying to do something that's, that's ambiguous or it's, it's incompatible to try and add strings and numbers or, or that type of thing. So be very aware when you choose the data types for your column that you choose an appropriate data type for the data that you're going to store there and for the operations that you're going to perform on it. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about multiple tables. Sure, yeah. So we've, we've seen how we can work with uh, one, one table. We've, we've seen that working quite happily. Let's look at what happens when you've got multiple tables in the database and you need to query and, and work with, with more than one table. So we've got our product table. We've been looking at this example all the way through, and here it is. And I've got that supplier column. The supplier is an integer value that identifies the supplier. And of course, really, that would be there would be a separate table of suppliers. So we can create a table called supplier that has an integer ID as its uh, primary key and it has a name and a phone number. So we, there we've got our, our supplier table there. And what we're trying to do is make sure that the values that go in our product table match suppliers that are in the supplier table. So when I insert into my supplier table some values there, I get my, my suppliers being quite happily added to there. 
you'll notice that I've got suppliers numbers one, two, and three. And in my um, product table, I've got existing products that are mapped to suppliers one and two. So all is, all is good in there and that's all fine, that works. What I wanna do is I wanna make sure that I can't insert a product with an invalid supplier. So I'm gonna alter my product table and I'm gonna add a constraint. And this time the constraint is something called a foreign key constraint. And what it's doing is it's saying, the supplier column in this table is the foreign key that references the primary key in another table. It pref right. re references the primary key in the supplier table. So whatever goes in this supplier column in this product table must match a value that's already in the supplier table. Now, if you run this and you've got existing data in the product table and some of that doesn't have a matching supplier number, what happens? Well, I, I can specify an override. I can specify whether I want to apply it to existing data and throw an error or just ignore existing data. So I actually get the option when I do that. What typically you might do is, is you, you might allow nulls um, so that you, you've got a kind of a workaround to say, right. hey, there's a null value in here. Now, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to insert some values into my product table. So I insert a new product, a Duda, and it's a 199, and it's from supplier number three. It's from a datum, and that's that's perfectly valid. I've got supplier number three. That's great. Now, if I try and insert something else in there, I'm going to insert a MacGuffin, and I'm going to reference supplier number five, but I'm going to get an error because there is no supplier number five. So I, I, I get an error thrown for that. So we're, we're applying what we call referential integrity. So do the other columns values get stored? Do we get a new row with MacGuffin in 299 and it just leaves out the five? It doesn't. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about transactions later on, but, but each time we insert just an individual statement, it's what we call an implicit transaction. SQL Server makes sure either the whole row gets inserted or nothing gets inserted. So if anything fails, nothing gets inserted. So let's look at the, uh, the, the key points we've, we've covered there then. Most databases, I think we saw the example of normalization at the beginning, most databases will have multiple tables as a direct result of that. And we use keys to determine the relationships between those tables. So a primary key uniquely identifies a row in, a, in an individual table, and you might use a foreign key that relates to the primary key in another table. So we, we can make that relationship between the two. And we can use foreign key constraints to enforce those rules, to prevent invalid data sessions, and we, um, we, we prevent deletions as well and updates. So, so for example, what would happen if I had a supplier and I had products that came from that supplier and then I deleted the supplier? Well, that would leave some orphan products. Right. So I want to prevent that. Sure. That whole thing is generally referred to as referential integrity, the integrity that, between the references between tables. Right. All right, well, let's see what this stuff looks like. Let's uh, have a demo. Sure. Well, you might remember in a, a previous demo, we created a table called customer and we created another table called account managers. So if I go and refresh my list of tables here, uh, you can see there's my customer table and there's my account managers table. And the idea is that each account manager is responsible for managing one or more customers. So each customer will have an account manager assigned to them is another way of thinking of that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a column to my customer table that tells me which account manager is the account manager for that customer. And I'm gonna do it by adding an integer value. You might remember, if, if we look in the account managers table, here's a little shortcut for you. If I right click account managers here, I can go and select the top 1000 rows just easily out of that. So we're going to do that. And it goes and generates the, the appropriate um, SQL for me. So I can see here are the account managers I've got, and each account manager is identified by a unique employee ID. So I've got an integer value here that identifies each account manager. So what I'm gonna do in my customers table, again, we'll just do the same thing with customer. Let's have a quick look at that. Each customer is also identified by a, a, an integer ID, but that's neither here nor there. There's nothing in this table that specifically says which account manager is, is associated with the customer. So we need to add a column to this table, basically. So we're gonna do that by using this alter table statement. We're altering the table, we're adding a column called account manager which is an integer. So it's gonna be the integer value that is the employee ID of the account manager that this um, uh, customer is managed by. And I've added this um, value here. First of all, I'm saying that I'm gonna allow null. So I'll allow the case where a customer doesn't have an employee ID, so, uh, an account manager associated with them. But when they do have, it will reference the account manager's table employee ID column. So in other words, the value that goes in here should match an employee ID that's in the account managers table. So let's go and run that. And off it goes and happily completes that. 
And if I have another look at my um, customers table, we'll just go and run that select top thousand rows again. I've now got my account manager column, that's been added to the table, but the values are all null just now because I haven't inserted any uh, customer ID values into there. Well, let's go in and do that. We'll update the customer table and we'll set the account manager for all of my um, customers to one. So whoever uh, account manager number one is, they're gonna be the account manager for all of the customers. And we'll just again go and verify that that's actually happened. So let's have a look. Yep, sure enough, account manager is set to one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new customer. So I've got a brand new customer in here. Um, this is uh, Rhonda Hughes, I'm adding her. And I'm specifying, when I insert the table, this last column here is the account manager column, and I'm specifying that this one has account manager number two. So if I go ahead and do that, sure enough, we've got one row affected. We've inserted that table in there. And if I go and look at my uh, customer table here, sure enough, Rhonda Hughes is in there with account manager number two. And if I look at my account managers table, we can even find out who that actually is. Employee number two is Rosie Reeves. So we know that Rosie Reeves is the account manager for Rhonda Hughes. All right, well, so far so good. What happens if I try to insert a new customer with a non-existent account manager? So we, we don't have an account manager. We don't have anybody with employee ID number nine, but we'll try and insert that into there. And actually that fails. We get an error that says the insert statement conflicted with the foreign key constraint. Remember when I altered the table, I specified that this has to reference the account manager's table employee ID column. That created this thing called a foreign key constraint. So the, the foreign key is the key in the customer's table that references the primary key in the account manager's table. And it says it violated, it conflicted with that foreign key constraint and it occurred in that database and the column was the employee ID column. So we've tried to insert a customer with an, uh, an account manager that doesn't exist in the uh, account manager's table. That is not allowed because of that constraint. So the statement is terminated and the customer is not inserted. So what we're really doing here is we're using foreign key constraints in order to enforce what we call referential integrity between the tables in my database, where I've got a value in one table that references a row in another table, we have referential integrity enforced here because of the constraints that prevents me from putting in a value in, the, in the, the, the first table that references something that doesn't exist in the second table. So what have we learned? Well, that's a good question. Let's take a look at the slide and see what we've covered in this module. We actually covered quite a lot. We talked about using the create table statement to create tables. So we've, uh, we've seen how to do that. We've seen how to use the insert statement to add rows. We'll talk more about um, you know, inserting and working with data uh, later on, but we've seen the basics of inserting rows and using the select statement to get rows back out of the table. And uh, we've talked about the idea of using constraints that define the relationships between primary keys in one table and a foreign key in that table that references a primary key in another table, and that enforces referential integrity between those tables. Well, you might remember in a, a previous demo, we created a table called customer and we created another table called account managers. So if I go and refresh my list of tables here, uh, you can see there's my customer table and there's my account managers table. And the idea is that each account manager is responsible for managing one or more customers. So each customer will have an account manager assigned to them is another way of thinking of that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a column to my customer table that tells me which account manager is the account manager for that customer. And I'm gonna do it by adding an integer value. You might remember if, if we look in the account managers table, here's a little shortcut for you. If I right click account managers here, I can go and select the top 1000 rows just easily out of that. So we're going to do that. And it goes and generates the, the appropriate um, SQL for me. So I can see here are the account managers I've got and each account manager is identified by a unique employee ID. So I've got an integer value here that identifies each account manager. So what I'm gonna do in my customers table, again, we'll just do the same thing with customer. Let's have a quick look at that. Each customer is also identified by a, a, an integer ID, but that's neither here nor there. There's nothing in this table that specifically says which account manager is, is associated with the customer. So we need to add a column to this table, basically. So we're gonna do that by using this alter table statement. We're altering the table, we're adding a column called account manager which is an integer. So it's gonna be the integer value that is the employee ID of the account manager that this um, 
uh, customer is managed by. And I've added this um, value here. First of all, I'm saying I'm going to allow null, so I'll allow the case where a customer doesn't have an employee ID, uh, an account manager associated with them. But when they do have, it will reference the account manager's table employee ID column. So in other words, the value that goes in here should match an employee ID that's in the account manager's table. So let's go and run that. And off it goes and happily completes that. And if I have another look at my um, customers table, we'll just go and run that select top thousand rows again. I've now got my account manager column. That's been added to the table, but the values are all null just now because I haven't inserted any uh, customer ID values into there. Well, let's go in and do that. We'll update the customer table and we'll set the account manager for all of my um, customers to one. So whoever uh, account manager number one is, they're going to be the account manager for all of the customers. And we'll just again go and verify that that's actually happened. So let's have a look. Yep, sure enough, account manager is set to one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new customer. So I've got a brand new customer in here. Um, this is uh, Rhonda Hughes, I'm adding her. And I'm specifying it when I insert the table, this last column here is the account manager column, and I'm specifying that this one has account manager number two. So if I go ahead and do that, sure enough, we've got one row affected. We've inserted that table in there. And if I go and look at my uh, customer table here, sure enough, Rhonda Hughes is in there with account manager number two. And if I look at my account manager's table, we can even find out who that actually is. Employee number two is Rosie Reeves. So we know that Rosie Reeves is the account manager for Rhonda Hughes. All right, well, so far so good. What happens if I try to insert a new customer with a non-existent account manager? So we, we don't have an account manager. We don't have anybody with employee ID number nine, but we'll try and insert that into there. And actually that fails. We get an error that says the insert statement conflicted with the foreign key constraint. Remember when I altered the table, I specified that this has to reference the account manager's table employee ID column, that created this thing called a foreign key constraint. So the, the foreign key is the key in the customer's table that references the primary key in the account manager's table. And it says it violated, it conflicted with that foreign key constraint and it occurred in that database and the column was the employee ID column. So we've tried to insert a customer with an, uh, an account manager that doesn't exist in the uh, account manager's table, that is not allowed because of that constraint. So the statement is terminated and the customer is not inserted. So what we're really doing here is we're using foreign key constraints in order to enforce what we call referential integrity between the tables in my database, where I've got a value in one table that references a row in another table, we have referential integrity enforced here because of the constraints that prevents me from putting in a value in, the, in the, the, the first table that references something that doesn't exist in the second table. So what have we learned? Well, that's a good question. Let's take a look at the slide and see what we've covered in this module. We actually covered quite a lot. We talked about using the create table statement to create tables. So we've, uh, we've seen how to do that. We've seen how to use the insert statement to add rows. We'll talk more about um, you know, inserting and working with data uh, later on, but we've seen the basics of inserting rows and using the select statement to get rows back out of the table. And uh, we've talked about the idea of using constraints that define the relationships between primary keys in one table and a foreign key in that table that references a primary key in another table. And that enforces referential integrity between those tables. Welcome back. Now that we've talked about uh, database basics and creating tables, Graham and I are going to talk about working with the data in the tables. Yeah, so uh, I, we've seen a, a little bit of kind of inserting and selecting data, but I, clearly there's more to it than that. So you bet. why don't you uh, tell us a bit about that? Okay, well, as Graham said, we need to talk about working with the data in the tables. And uh, there's kind of a handy way to remember this. Um, it's all about CRUD. Um, and I know that seems a little odd, but bear with me here. But CRUD, or C-R-U-D, uh, represents the four operations that you'll perform on data in tables. C for create, R for read, U for update, and D for delete. Now, to be clear, these aren't necessarily the T-SQL commands you'll use in a SQL database, but they are the terms that we use across the industry, and we'll talk about what commands you'll actually use uh, as part of this discussion. So create, what does that mean? It means we're going to create a new record, a new row in the table. And we do that with insert. 
and we'll talk about and see some demos of insert and a few different variations of it as part of our work here. So to create is to insert a new row into the table. You're creating a new employee or a new product uh, or a, a new transaction in the transaction table. Now, the reverse is to pull out the data and look at it, and that's to read the data. And to read in T-SQL, we select. And you saw a bit of that in the last module, as you did insert. Um, but we'll look at some special cases of it coming up. So we've got create for insert. We've got read for select. To update, well, there's not much of a change here. To update, we'll update. So to update is to change a row in place. Now, as you get deeper into working with SQL Server, you'll, you'll see that logically we actually think of uh, an update as deleting the old and replacing it with the new. But for our purposes, it's one logical operation. We are going to update something in place. So C, R, U, and now D for delete. And again, not much of a change here in terms of the language. To delete is to remove the row, the entire row. Uh, there's not a way to say, delete column one and column three, but leave column two there. Um, if you need to make modifications like that, you're leaving the row in place, and so that's an update. All right, so CRUD, C-R-U-D, create, read, update, and delete, or in SQL Server, insert, select, update and delete. All right, well, that all sounds pretty good. I'd like to see some of that in action, so I'm, I guess you've got a demo up your sleeve for us. I do. Let's take a look at some cred. Great. Okay, so you've heard a, a little bit about CRUD, create and retrieve and update and delete, or uh, insert and select and update and delete. Um, the challenge, though, is if you're going to write an application uh, against a database, you really don't want to be issuing each of those commands ad hoc. Um, it would be much more convenient for you, and certainly for your readers, if they're going to be running reports or what have you, to be able to wrap that up into an object and then call that object by name. And that's where we get into the idea of stored procedures and then some other items in in SQL Server, such as views or functions. So the idea here is that we are wrapping up our CRUD. We are taking our CRUD operations, and we're putting a programmatic wrapper around them so that we then invoke it by name. So we still have our insert, select, and update, and delete. But let's talk about what you might do with those programmatically. So let's take Graham's table from earlier. We've got our product table with our product ID, and our name, and our price, and our supplier. And let's say that we want to retrieve or select some information from that table. Well, we know now that we can write a select statement. And here we're saying select just the name and price columns from the product table, and only give me those rows where the supplier equals two. And so even before we run this, we can probably look back at that table and say, all right, we're going to get thingy-bob. So sure enough, we execute that and we get thingy-bob. Well, that's fine, but I don't expect my users to be able to write that T-SQL uh, every time they want to run a report. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to put a wrapper around that. So let's take that same approach and let's create a view. And a view is a way of storing that select statement by giving it a name. And then we select from the view instead of having to pass in all of the data. And as we'll see in the upcoming demo, there are going to be some, some limitations on views, and there are some rules that we'll learn. Uh, but for now, look at it this way. We're going to say create view VW underscore product price as, and whatever follows as is going to be effectively the source code of this view. So create view VW product price as, and then we use that same statement. Select name price from product where supplier equals two. But this time when we run this code in SQL, as we'll see in the demo, to use it, we'll then say select name and price from VW product price. We could even say select asterisk, select star from VW product price, since those are the only two columns. And we'll get the same response. So why bother? Again, we don't need our users to know um, all of the, the, the names of the columns. Uh, we don't necessarily want to give them access to the table itself. We may just want to make it convenient. We don't need them to learn T-SQL. But as we'll see in the demo, there'll be some other things we can do with this. Let's look at this a different way. Remember, CRUD isn't just about uh, re retrieve. CRUD is also about making modifications. So let's take two other tables here. I've got a little savings table with an account ID and a balance. And I've got a checking table also with an account ID and a balance. And if we look closely, we'll see that uh, account ID 3 has been highlighted in bold in each of these. That's where we're going to do some work. All right. Well, let's start with what the, the, the source CRUD statements would be, and then we'll put a wrapper around that programmatically. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, write some code that effectively transfers money from checking into savings. I'm going to move $500 out of checking into savings for that account ID 3. So you'll see two SQL statements on the left-hand side of my screen. You'll see update savings. All right, so we're going to make a change to the savings table. And then we'll use the set keyword to tell it exactly what we're doing. And we'll see set balance plus equals 500. And that plus equals is a compound operator that means take the existing value and add 500 to it. You might also write this as set balance equals balance plus 500. Same thing. This is just a little bit more compact. So set the balance plus equals 500 where account ID equals 3. And then we move on and say update checking set the balance minus equals 500 where account ID equals 3. So that's two separate operations, but we want them to run together. So that's where, again, putting a wrapper around this will come into play. So we'll run this. We'll see now that my checking account is down to 500 and my savings is up to 1500. Great. So how do I wrap that? In this case, I'm going to create a stored procedure. And so I'll use the T-SQL statement create procedure. I'll give it a name, transfer funds. And, and bear in mind, this is called transfer funds just for the purposes of this slide. Uh, I would normally need to supply a two-part name. We'll see more of that in the demo. So I'll say create procedure transfer funds as, and then what follows is my source code. So in order to invoke this, I will use the T-SQL execute, which we can abbreviate exec, and I'll say exec transfer funds. Now, there's a lot we can do to improve this, to make it more interesting. We'll get to some of that stuff in the demo. But the idea now is, instead of having to write each of those individual statements myself, I can just call it by name. And this is the kind of thing you might map to a button on a form. However, I, I want to make sure it's clear that just by wrapping this in a T-SQL statement, we're not necessarily putting any kind of error handling in, in this. We're not doing anything that says if one of these succeeds, the other has to succeed, or vice versa. So uh, just to hint at what's coming, and, and we'll get much more into this into our uh, SQL development courses, the kind of thing we might add to this is going to be a, a transaction where we put a wrapper around the, the, the operations and say, um, here's a marker. We're going to begin a transaction. We're going to say what happens now below this must all succeed or it all fails. So we say begin tran. We still have our two update statements. And then if we get this far successfully, we can commit the transaction. It can all be saved to disk. And there are other things we would build into this. For example, we might have some error handling to roll it back. This is not complete code. This is just pseudocode for the purposes of this slide. So as you're seeing, there are ways to create this programmatic layer that you'll use to access your CRUD code. Uh, we took a brief look at a view. We took a brief look at a stored procedure. There's lots more you can do with both types of objects, as well as objects like functions. Uh, we'll take a look at some of these later in the course. So uh, I, what I'd really like to see now is an example of how I build some of these stored procedures or whatever to wrap up my, uh, my CRUD operations. All right, let's take a look at a demo. Okay, well, we saw quite a bit in this module. Let's uh, have a recap. So we learned that we, while we store our data in tables, we are going to manage our data through what we're lovingly calling CRUD operations, create and retrieve and update and delete. To create data, you've seen a couple different ways that we use insert. To retrieve it, we're going to use the select statement. To update it, use the shockingly named update statement. <laughs> to delete your data, Again, you'll use delete. Now be careful, you delete from a table, you don't drop the table. Right. Or somebody's going to have a very bad day. Yeah. And then rather than issue a whole bunch of individual CRUD statements, we tend to create wrappers for them. We create views, procedures, or even something we didn't get a chance to talk about in this module called functions. And so for select statements, we can use views, which then we can select from. Um, or we can use procedures and execute the procedure to cause our select statements to run. And finally, we can put all of the above into procedures. Inserts, updates, deletes, and even selects. Thanks for watching. Well, welcome back. Uh, we've made it to the dizzying heights of module four so far, so we're, uh, we're certainly making some progress. And in this module, we are going to look at some techniques that we can use to optimize the performance of the queries that we're performing against those tables.
So I'll finally get my question answered about speeding up queries for multiple tables. Absolutely. All right. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about how we can use indexes, first of all, to improve the performance of our database. So when you hear the word index, uh, if, if you're not in the database world, I, I guess what you think of is, is an index in a book. So you might have a book, and in that book, when you open it up, you've, you may have a book like a telephone directory. So things are already organized in the right order. In effect, the index is, is the, the content itself. It's already in the right order. Um, and as you flick through the book, everything's in, in, in the appropriate order, so it's easy to find things. So you can think of that as being a, being a kind of you know, indexed content. It's in the, in the right order already. And uh, the other thing you might find is you, you might have uh, an, an index at the back of a book that you go as a kind of secondary index um, where you can go and look up specific things that are in that book. So perhaps um, in our telephone directory, we might have different categories of things that we want to look up. So if I want to look up a restaurant, I can go to the back and find out uh, pages for different restaurants or whatever it might be. So you can, you can get this idea of an index as a way of organizing information so that you can find it easily. That's, that's the point. It's, it means I have to read through less pages to get to the, the data that I'm looking for, get to the information I need. So the same thing is true in a database. Here's, here's a table in my database. I've got um, this uh, sales.product table, and it's got a list of products in there. And all of that under the covers will actually be stored on pages and disk. We, we, we literally call them pages that are stored on the disk. And I want to make it easier to look these uh, things up and, and reduce the number of pages I need to read to get to the, the record that I'm interested in. So I'm going to create something called a clustered index on this, uh, this table here. So I've got this create clustered index statement. Give it a name, in this case, IDX product ID. And I'm creating it on that table. And I'm doing it on the product ID column. So what's going to happen is the pages where that data is stored is physically going to be organized on the disk in the order of the product ID. That's the field that's, that's part of that index. I could have multiple fields. I could make an index that, that spans uh, multiple fields, a, a composite index, if you like. But in this case, it's, it's just on that one field. So the data pages, all the records, will be stored on pages in that order, in the order of product ID. And that means when I uh, come to query that, I can go and use this index. I've got this index page here that I'm going to look up first of all. And I can see on that index page that, right, if I'm looking for um, anything that begins with a 1, then I'm going to take that, that left fork there. And that's true right the way up to 3. And then if, it, if it's 3 or above, I take the right fork. So you can imagine I get this kind of tree-like structure in the index. That I can navigate the, uh, the different branches of the tree to get to the page that I need. And that's going to reduce the number of pages I need to read. If, if the, uh, the index didn't exist, I would just have to read all of the pages in the, the table and then go through them one by one to find the, the data that I want. Now, the other thing I can do, I can create one clustered index per table, because, of course, it can only be in one order. But I can also create something called a non-clustered index. And I can create multiple non-clustered indexes. And again, they get a name. So in this case, I'm calling it IDX name, because it's on the name column. And you can see what happens here is I've, I've got an index that's, that's based on the name. So I've got all of the A's take that left fork. And then from M onwards, I go to the, the right fork. And then the page that, that I get to from there actually points me to the index page of the clustered index. So if I've got a clustered index and then I build a non-clustered index on top, actually what happens is the non-clustered index helps me find the appropriate pages in the clustered index to then get to the records I need. So there's a, a level of, of indirection. If I don't have a clustered index, then I get a row ID and I go and search for the individual row in the, the heap of pages that we have w without the clustered index. So you can see the idea then that I, I create a, a clustered index that determines the order that the data is actually stored in on the disk. I can have one clustered index per table. And then I can create one or more non-clustered indexes for additional fields that I commonly search on just to reduce the number of pages I need to read to go and get that, that data. So just to remind you then, a clustered index determines the order in which the, the rows are stored. You can only have one per table. If you don't have a clustered index, then the table, by the way, is known as a heap. And a non-clustered index stores pointers either to the row ID of a heap, if you haven't got a clustered index, or to the cluster key of the clustered index. And you can have multiple non-clustered indexes on a table. All right, good stuff about indexes. Can you show us some more? Absolutely. Let's take a look at a demo. Right, well, let's take a look at um, something to do with indexes here. And what we've got here is a, a table. I've created a table called sales order detail. And um, this is technically is what we'd call a heap. There's no indexes on this table. It's just a, a bunch of data in a table that is stored in pages on, on disk. Um, but we're not really worried about indexing it at all. 
So um, let's take a look at um, querying from that table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn some options on. I'm going to turn on something called the, uh, the statistics I.O. so we can see how many pages are read when we, uh, we go and retrieve data from that um, table. So let's go ahead and set our statistics I.O. on. And I'm going to set an option to show the actual execution plan. There's a couple of options up here. I'm going to show the execution plan. And what that will do is give me a visual representation of how the SQL Server query engine is actually performing the, the query, what it's doing under the covers to go and get the data from the table. And we're just going to do a very simple query. We're going to select the product ID and the order quantity where the sales order ID is a particular sales order. So get me the products and the, the number of, of those products that were ordered for a specific order from this table. We'll go ahead and we'll run that. And I get back my uh, product ID and my order quantity coming back from the order table. So it's, it's worked, it's got the data from me. If I take a look at the execution plan here, um, it's kind of small, so you might not be able to read it, but you can see that we've done what's called a table scan. It's effectively just gone and scanned the entire table to find the rows that satisfy the query, to find the, 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 um, or the, the products and uh, quantities for that particular order. If I just click on the messages tab, um, then I can see some of the, the statistics that have been returned for that uh, query. So I can see the thing I'm really interested in here is the, the logical reads. That's the number of pages that were read in order to find those uh, rows that we returned from the query. And I can see that there's 1,496 pages that needed to be read in order to find just those two uh, rows that we returned. So that's, that's me querying a heap. There's no index. We had no choice really but to read the entire table and just find the, uh, the appropriate pages. Let's try creating a clustered index. So we'll create a clustered index. Um, it's called IDX sales order ID, and it's on the sales order ID column. So we'll go ahead and we'll uh, create that. And that goes and creates my index. Um, I, I get the, the stats coming back from that. This is irrelevant. That's just what happened when we, we created the index. And now we're going to try that query again. We're going to try and, and get the product ID and the order quantity from the sales order detail for that specific sales order. And we're identifying the sales order using the sales order ID, which we now have a clustered index on. So if we go ahead and run that query, again, it returns the, the data. If I look at the execution plan again this time, you can see it's slightly different. It does a clustered index seek. So it's actually using my clustered index that I've created. The SQL Server is smart enough to realize, hey, there's a clustered index there. I can use that to get the data. And if I look at the messages, our logical reads have gone down from 1,400 and odd to three. So the index is, is very effective in reducing the number of pages that we needed to read in order to find that data. Well, let's try something else. Let's try getting the orders by product. I want to find out all the orders where I've ordered product number 758. So let's go ahead and run that. And it brings me back the sales order ID for all of the columns where I've, I've uh, ordered that particular product. And if I look at the execution plan, again, it's using the clustered index. Even though I'm not filtering on that, that indexed value, uh, the clustered index is still a useful way to find the pages that I need. So we're, we're using that um, clustered index. And if I have a look at the messages, I can see the logical reads. There were, there were 1,575 logical reads to get all of the pages that I needed. But we were, we were using the, the index, so we got a little bit of optimization there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and further optimize. Now, I, I can't create a second clustered index because a table can only have one clustered index. The data can only be stored you know, in one order. But I can create a non-clustered index. I can create a, a secondary index on this table. And it's going to be based on the product ID column. So again, that column that we're filtering on. We'll go ahead and create that. And let's try that same query again. This time we are going to bring back the, um, all the orders for where we ordered that product, product number 758. And if I have a look at the execution plan this time, oh look, we're using the non-clustered index now. So SQL Server is smart enough to realize, hey, that's a better way of doing this. I've got a non-clustered index on the product ID. That's an easier way to find the rows that I need. And when I look at the, uh, the messages here, our, again, our logical reads is reduced dramatically. We're back down to three logical reads. We've only had to read three pages in order to satisfy that query. And then what happens if I actually include in my, um, my query a non-index field? So I'm, I'm searching for the sales order ID and the order quantity, which I haven't got any index on from the sales order detail where the product ID was 758. So I'm still filtering on the product ID, but I'm including the order quantity this time and the, uh, the sales order ID. So we'll go ahead and run that. 
and I get back the sales order ID and the order quantity. And if I have a look at the execution plan for this one, well, this time SQL Server has made the, the decision to use both indexes. It uses the, the non-clustered index because we're filtering on the product ID, so it goes and filters on that. But it's also then using the clustered index to do the key lookup to find the order quantities. So we're, we're taking advantage of both of those indexes as we run that query. And again, if we look at the scans, there's 829 reads, so a few more reads because we're bringing back more information. Some of those reads are pages from the non-clustered index, and then we're using that to find the appropriate pages in the clustered index that we then use to go and get the order quantities. So there's, a, there's an intelligent engine underneath that is using those indexes to reduce the number of reads and optimize the query uh, performance as best it can. Okay, let's talk a little bit about column store indexes then, a particular type of index that I can use uh, to work with my data. And in this case, we're back to our, our sales.product table. You can see I've got my product ID, my name, my price, and my supplier in that table. And I want to be able to query that, and I want to do it using really high performance. Perhaps this table is part of a, a, a data warehouse. Uh, so maybe this is a this would be perhaps a dimension table that I would have in a data warehouse, and I'd have a fact table that had maybe the sales of the products or something like that. And what I want to do is I want to take, take my index and rather have my index rather than have my index organized like this in these sort of pages of, that contain rows, which is a traditional index would store it. I want to store it a slightly different way. I actually want to split those into row groups and index the columns. I actually want to be able to use the, the columns as the basis of the index. So we've got row groups that are then organized into these segments that are going to be the columns. Um, that allow me to, to uh, store the indexes. And that's going to allow me to take advantage of things like compression because a lot of these columns may have you know, multiple rows that have the same value and that makes them nice and easy to compress. And then we can store that in memory and that's going to optimize my, my ability to query that. So we, we um, compress these segments, we put them in memory and we're then able to query them using this, this column store idea. So it's a slightly different way of thinking about indexes. And what we're going to do is we're going to create this uh, using a, a similar syntax to what we saw before, but this time it's create clustered column store index, uh, and then the name of the index on the table. Now you notice because I'm, I'm creating a, a clustered column store index on a table, I haven't specified any individual columns because I can create a, a column store index for the entire table. Um, and it's just going to create an index that has all of those, those different columns, those, those segments uh, stored in, in memory, and I can then query that using the column store index and get the benefits of performance. So that's a clustered column store index. Um, I've also got the option of creating non-clustered column store indexes. So I can create a non-clustered column store index, and then I can specify the individual field names that I want to use in this case. So I've created that on the, um, the product ID and the name. Those might be the ones that I most commonly query, so I can go ahead and, and create that column store index on those. So column store indexes then, the, the important things to remember from, from the point of view of, of really just getting the fundamentals of this, they are stored in memory and they store the data by column instead of by row. So traditional indexes, you, you're really indexing to find a row of data. Here we're indexing by column. And that allows us, when we've got columns that have multiple instances of the same value in that column, we get really good compression ratios that allows us to compress that data, compress the indexes, and store that in memory to improve performance. They can be clustered or non-clustered, and, and a clustered column index, clustered column store index can include all of the columns. I can just create a clustered column store index on the table, and that will by default include all of the columns in the table. Um, and I can create um, only one clustered column store index per table. That's important to remember as well. Um, when you create a, 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 a table, just like an, an ordinary index, you only have one clustered index. You can only have one clustered column store index per table. Wow, column store indexes look kind of cool. Can we see some more? Sure, let's have a look. All right, well, we're going to take a look at column store indexes. So I, again, I've got a couple of tables here. I've got one called uh, dbo.product and one called dbo.product inventory. So I've got a table of products, and then the inventory table tells me information about how many of those products I have in stock and where they're stored in the warehouse. So if I have a look down here, I can see here's the product table. I've got a list of products with their names and numbers and all that sort of thing. And if I scroll down underneath that, I've got another table called product inventory where I've got the product ID, so that's what we're relating the tables on, and then I've got various locations, shelves, bins, and quantities of where I'm storing that product in, in my warehouse. So again, we're going to turn our statistics I.O. on like we did in the previous demo where we looked at uh, just regular indexes because I want to see what's happening when I go and uh, query these, these uh, two tables. And I'm going to stick on the, the uh, actual execution plan here. <clears throat> 
just so we see what's happening under the covers. And we're ready to go and query these tables. Now this, this query, we haven't really uh, looked at the syntax in any detail before, but we're, we're selecting the name of the product from the product table and the list price. So the product name and the, the product list price. And then from the inventory table, we're bringing about the shelf, the bin and the quantity. And we're bringing that from the product table, which we're just calling P just for convenience. And joining that to the product inventory table, which we're calling I. And the join is based on that common key. Remember that, that foreign key relationship we talked about uh, way back at the beginning, where we've got our product ID that relates to the product ID in the inventory table. And then we're filtering on the product name. So it's a, a, a bit more of a complicated query than we might have seen so far. But fundamentally, we're just bringing back some data from both of these tables and we're filtering based on the product name rear brakes. I'm only interested in that particular product. And what I want to know is bring back the name and the price of that product and the shelf, bin and quantity that I have in the warehouse. Let's go ahead and run that query. And I get it back and I can see, well, I've, I've got three rows. So there's three locations where I store that product on shelf E, shelf M and shelf W. And I can see the bin and the quantity that I have in the warehouse there. So let's have a look at what happened when we ran that query. If I look at the execution plan, it basically did two table scans. Because these, are, these tables are heaps, there are no indexes on them. So we've, we've scanned the products table, we've scanned the uh, product inventory table, we've used a hash match to join those things together. Don't worry too much about the details of that, but we've, we've joined them together and got back the results. And if I look at the messages, I can see for all of the different uh, operations that happened there, the number of reads that happened. And I'm interested in the, the logical reads. So I've got my product was logical read 13 and my product inventory table, there were uh, seven logical reads um, that, that returned that data. So a fair amount of work going on under the covers to return the information. Let's create a column store index. I'm gonna create a clustered column store index and a clustered column store index is always based on all of the columns in the table. So we're going to create that on the product inventory table. So clustered column store index. And now let's go and run that same query again. So here we are, we're going to bring back all of the uh, locations in my warehouse for my rear brakes. And we get back the same results. And this time if I look at the execution plan, We've actually, when, when it came to taking the data from the products table, we still don't have any indexes on the products table, so we just scanned that table. And that was 71% of the cost of the, the query. So 71% effectively of the effort was involved in scanning that table. And then we've used this uh, column store index that we created our, uh, on our product inventory table to bring back the data from, from that table. And if I look at the, the messages tab here, well, there are fewer operations. There's only three operations going on here. And what we've done here is we've still got logical reads going on from my product inventory table. There are actually none because um, it, it didn't need to get them. It got them from the, uh, uh, sorry, from the product inventory table. There are no logical reads. It got some logical reads from the product table. But it read a segment from the um, product inventory table. So when we have a column store index, we're actually storing the data column wise in segments. So it only read one segment from there and was able to get that data. Well, let's see if we can further optimize this by adding another uh, column store index. This time we'll add a non-clustered column store index on the product table. And because it's a non-clustered index, we can specify individual columns. So we're gonna have a product ID name and list price columns in this index. Let's go ahead and create that. And again, we'll go and run that same query again, just to see what actually happens under the covers. Get back the same results as you would expect. And the execution plan this time, it uses both of my column store indexes. It uses the, the clustered column store index on the product inventory table, and it uses the non-clustered column store index on the product table to bring back the data. And again, when I look at the operations here, I'm getting segment counts here because it's reading those segments from the, uh, the in-memory column store um, uh, index, and that's gonna optimize the query and make that perform faster. We don't really notice it particularly in this example because it's such a small table, but with a very large table that you might have in something like a data warehouse where you've got you know, potentially millions of rows, um, then this type of operation can really improve the performance of your queries. All right, well, I've, I've already created a database here. I've created a database called MemDB, and that's because if I'm gonna use uh, memory optimized uh, tables, there, there is something I have to do when I create the, the database. I have to create this thing called a file group that contains memory optimized data. So don't worry about the details of that too much. It's just something we have to do when we're gonna be using this technology. We have to add this type of file group to the database. But I've already done that and I'm now ready to go and create a memory optimized table. So 
Way back at the beginning of this course, we looked at creating tables using the create table statement. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use this, this memdb database. We're going to create a table called dbo.memory table. It's going to have an ID column, which is of type integer, which is the primary key. And because it's an in-memory table, I've, I've got this option of using what's called a non-clustered hash, where I, I basically just hash the value into in-memory buckets. So I'm storing it in locations in memory based on the value that's in that, that column. So I'm storing that, that data in memory. And I'm going to have a date value, which is just a date time, and that's going to allow null values. So we're creating a date time, a column called date value, which, uh, which stores date time values. Now, the important bit here is that is in this with clause, I've said with memory optimized equals on. So it's an in-memory table that I'm creating. And the durability is I'm going to persist the schema and the data to disk. So as well as having the data in memory, it's going to be persisted so that when the database is taken down and then brought back up again, the, the table still exists. Sometimes you might just want to store uh, the schema. You might want to let the data get deleted every time the database is taken off, uh, maybe just because you're, you're using it as some sort of cache for a web application or something like that. But we're going to go ahead and create that table. Let's go and do that. And just for comparison, I'm going to create the same table, the same structure, but just as a regular on disk table, the same type of table we've been using uh, all the way through. So we're just going to get a table called disk table, which has an, an integer ID column and a, a date time, uh, date value column. So exactly the same structure. Let's go ahead and create that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a transaction. We talked about transactions earlier. We're going to use a transaction and we're going to insert 500,000 rows into the disk table. And while that's running, I'm also going to insert 500,000 rows into the in-memory table. So I'm using pretty much exactly the same code, except for the name of the table. So I'm just going to copy the, the code for the, the memory table to the, the clipboard. And I'm going to go and run this code that inserts 500,000 rows into the disk table. So let's go and run that. And off that goes and starts running, I can see it's executing query. And I can see down here the amount of time that's elapsing as that goes along. So we're at six seconds now. And while that's running, I'm just going to create a new query. And I'm going to paste in the same code and insert into the in-memory table. So we'll run that at the same time simultaneously. We're running both of these queries. So this one starts executing. And I can see the amount of time elapsed down here. And that one's now finished. So that took seven seconds. And if I go back to this one, well, that's finished as well. But it took 17 seconds. So I can already see, because my um, memory table is in memory, using a transaction to insert 500,000 rows was quicker. It was 10 seconds quicker doing that in the in-memory table than on the disk table. And just to verify that we have, in fact, done that, if I select the count of rows from the disk table, there's 500,000. And if I select the count of rows from the memory table, there's also 500,000. So no cheating. We've got nothing up my sleeves. We're ju just genuinely seeing that it's faster to insert data into an in-memory table. Now, if I go and delete from the uh, the disk table, let's go ahead and do that. We'll delete from there. Off it goes, and it starts deleting. It's taking a little bit of time. Again, we'll just do the same thing in another connection from the memory table. So we'll just go and delete from there. And that happens almost instantaneously. It was zero seconds on the clock for deleting from the in-memory table, uh, whereas it took 14 seconds to delete those rows from the disk table. So again, the delete is uh, another thing that's, uh, that's taking longer to do on the disk based table. Now, one of the things we talked about when we were uh, talking about this earlier on was we looked at the, the idea of, of native store procedures. So as well as creating these in-memory tables that are actually C-sharp structs that are then compiled to DLLs, we can create store procedures that are C-sharp code compiled to, to DLL. And I'm going to create one called insert data. Uh, and the way that we, we make it a, a native compiled store procedure is we say with native compilation. So native compilation, another couple of options on here we don't need to worry about too much about. And it's going to use this atomic transaction. It begins a transaction, and it's going to do the same thing we did earlier on. It's going to loop around. It's going to insert 500,000 rows into that table. So we'll go ahead and create that store procedure. So I now have a natively compiled store procedure that's an in-memory DLL and a natively uh, or a, a memory optimized table that again is an in-memory DLL. So let's run that store procedure, which does exactly the same insert we did earlier on. And you might remember it took 17 seconds to insert 500,000 rows into the disk-based table. It took seven seconds to insert 500,000 rows into the, the memory table. If I use it, uh, a, a memory optimized store procedure, well, it took less than a second 
insert 500,000 rows. So again, we're seeing that that in-memory technology for both tables and stored procedures, in this particular case, because it's a, it's a latch-bound workload, there's a transaction going on that's locking pages, it's, it's significantly faster using this in-memory technology uh, to work with these tables. All right, so we've covered a, a few things in this uh, module to optimize performance. Let's, yeah. just, let's just recap on what we've, right. we've looked at. So we talked about using indexes to optimize select performance. Um, and you can have one clustered index on each table and multiple non-clustered indexes per table. Um, it does optimize the select performance. You do have to be careful that, you know, if you have just index everything, then your inserts and updates are all going to suffer performance issues. But it's a good way of optimizing select performance. We talked about column store indexes. Uh, those work really well in those kind of large scale data warehousing type uh, scenarios. And uh, what we're doing there is effectively indexing based on columns rather than rows. And we're storing those column indexes in memory. So we're getting some, some good uh, performance optimization from that. Works very well when you've got highly compressible data, columns that have the same repeated value in them. And we saw that there were some improvements in SQL 2016 yeah. for this. Yeah. And we've also talked about memory optimized tables. Um, so the idea of creating a table, but actually when we create it, under the cover, SQL Server generates a C-sharp um, struct that represents that table, compiles that into a DLL, and stores that in memory. So we get that uh, in-memory performance. And we can do the same thing with stored procedures. We natively compile stored procedures. The, the big scenario where you want to use that is where you have contention-bound workloads, where you've got um, multiple people trying to access the same data at the same time. Uh, if you're using transactions to lock the tables, then that can give you contention issues. In-memory tables are a great way of optimizing that particular workload. So hopefully you've enjoyed uh, looking at ways of optimizing uh, the, the database. Uh, join us in the, the next module as we move on through the course. Welcome back. In this module, Graham and I are going to talk about non-relational data types. We'll talk about XML, we'll talk about JSON, we'll talk about using a document database, and we'll even talk a little bit about spatial data for maps. All right, well, to talk about XML in SQL Server um, has a little bit of prerequisite knowledge needed. And this course isn't designed to get into any real depth about XML, but to help you understand where XML fits in the overall scheme of things with, uh, with SQL Server. So let's start with a, a very quick uh, primer on what XML is about. Um, and so you'll see a, a blob of XML on my screen. And um, if you've never worked with XML before, it may look like, boy, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, if, you've if you've worked with XML, you'll probably recognize quite a few things. So again, without going in, in, in tremendous depth, um, let's talk about what XML represents and why you might use it. So why work with XML data in SQL Server or in Azure SQL Database? Well, basically, it's because you already have XML, and you need to store it. You need to be able to transmit it between applications. Um, you're typically not going to be uh, creating new applications using a SQL database uh, and then decide to use XML as the data type. Uh, typically, you're using XML because you're already interchanging with other applications. So um, let's take a quick look at what makes this XML. Uh, the first thing you might notice as you're looking at the code is that everything's wrapped in angle brackets. And if you've worked with other markup languages like uh, HTML, for example, this might look familiar. Uh, let's take a look at some of the things that make this up. So we start with a processing instruction. That first line that begins and ends with question marks is essentially an instruction to the parser that's built into whatever application is working with the XML. So SQL Server and Azure SQL Database have a built-in XML parser, um, as does a web browser, for example. So that's a processing instruction that just happens to say things like, what version of XML am I? What, uh, what kind of character encoding am I using? Uh, it's not stuff that we're going to care about much, except that your parser will want it there. And then you'll start to see the actual payload of the XML in the form of elements. And so the interesting thing about XML is that, unlike HTML, the elements are user defined, or in this case, developer defined. That's us. So we're defining an element called salesperson, for example. And uh, here we've got a salesperson, and there's an ID value and a name value, and those are actually going to be called attributes. Again, these are things that we define. And, we, and uh, the, the beauty about working with this in SQL Server is that SQL Server can recognize them, and SQL Server can store them and operate on them. 
So we've got elements such as the salesperson, and we're storing attributes like their ID and their name. Uh, we'll see the ability to store those attributes either as quote delimited or simply as text. And the difference between these uh, basically goes to what kind of programmatic operations you'll perform to extract or modify those. Um, you'll see, again, uh, more interesting things with collections of attributes. Uh, I've got a, a collection here called items, and it's got two different item attributes, uh, which then, uh, I'm sorry, item, uh, item elements, which then have attributes. And uh, there's, no, there, there's no sort order about this yet. The only real rules are that the brackets have to match and that it is case sensitive. So how do I work with this with SQL Server? Let's take some sample data. I've got a portion of a table. In this case, I'm going to use a, a sample table called salesLT.customer. And uh, I'm going to pull the last name out of it, but I'm going to use the top operator here simply to prevent pulling hundreds and thousands of records out of, out of the column. So I'm going to say select top five last name from salesLT.customer. And if I ran that all by itself, I'd get results similar to what you see on the right-hand side of my screen. But if I add some of SQL Server's XML processing instructions, I can get that converted to XML without having to write a whole lot of additional code. So in this particular case, I'm saying I want the, these results as XML using an auto formatting rule. And I'm going to wrap these in a root element called customer. So if you recall from the previous slide, we had a sales order. And now we've got one called customer. So if I execute this in SQL Server, I'll get a result back similar to what you see. So it says, all right, well, for each of these customers, we're going to give it a, 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 an element name of sales.lt.customer. That's the table name. And what's, what's doing this is that auto instruction. And then the column name of last name equals, and then we've got the, uh, the attribute uh, value, which is G or Harris or Carreras or what have you. So that's one way you can work with XML. And so you can have data that's not even in XML in SQL Server and retrieve it in that form. Now, I should point out there's a, a bit more to it than that as you get into the nuts and bolts of it. For example, SQL Server doesn't put that prologue. And there are some other bits to the XML that a very strict parser uh, might object to. And so you might have to do some additional massaging. Some other things you can do with uh, XML in SQL Server and Azure SQL Database are do things like passing in um, a, an entire blob of XML in a variable, for example, and then traversing the hierarchy in that XML to pull out information. So here we've got some code using the from open XML function where we're passing in a variable and then we're telling it what, the, what part of the tree to, to traverse. So start at the root level and move down to the customer level and then take those results and assign them column names of customer ID and contact name. And so the results might look like this. So the idea here is you can have an application pass in a chunk of XML as text, and SQL Server will be able to interpret it and figure out what the hierarchy is, what's an element, what's a child element, what's an attribute, what's a value, and bring those back. I'll show you more of this later in the course. So, how do, how do we do this? What's, what's available? There's a wide range of things for XML support in SQL Server. Um, I won't read this slide to you, but you'll see some of the, uh, the options. So there's an XML data type, for example, where we can actually store the XML in a native form. Instead of storing it as text and having to convert it to and fro, we can store it in an XML value. Uh, there's the XML, uh, excuse me, the, the X query feature that gives us that language that will enable us to, to walk down the nodes of the hierarchy. Um, there are a whole set of uh, index structures that we can build to improve performance and so on. So the XML stuff looks uh, pretty useful. I think a lot of people have, have worked with XML and need to work with that. Let's uh, see an example of that. All right, we've got a demo. Let's take a look. Well, our next topic is JSON, and JSON is part of the larger NoSQL uh, movement. And uh, what some people think of when they think of NoSQL is that they don't want to have a SQL Server. They don't want to have a heavy-duty relational engine. And one of the things that's interesting about SQL Server support for what we're going to see is that you can actually think of NoSQL as not only SQL, which is to say you've got your relational data, but you can also have this non-relational data, such as XML that we just talked about, and then some of the other things we're going to look at here. So with that as context, let's talk about JSON. 
So what is JSON? JSON is the JavaScript object not notation, and it's essentially a lightweight data interchange format. And you, you've thought, well, I've heard this before. That's what XML was called. I don't think anybody's ever called XML lightweight. But the idea here is it's easier to read and write, certainly, than XML. Um, it's language independent, which means you can use any of your .NET languages or other languages to work with it. And if you're familiar with JavaScript, you're already familiar with the syntax for JSON because it uses objects and arrays and values uh, just like you're, you're used to with, uh, with JavaScript. So the idea here is we can take JSON and store the application data natively in SQL Server instead of, again, passing in strings and having to convert them as we store them and convert them back as we read them out. Now, the way that we would store them in SQL Server is in uh, using the nvarchar data type or using another feature of the, the, the SQL Server data platform, which is called DocumentDB, that we'll be looking at in the next topic. So at a very high level, again, our goal here is not so much to teach you all of the details of these, but to place them in context with the data family. Uh, let's take a brief look at JSON objects. The idea is that we're going to identify name and value pairs using colons. So we're stripping away a lot of that extra, uh, extra language of XML with brackets and all of that, and we're simply going to have name, colon, value. Um, if you're representing an object, you'll wrap that in curly braces. And if you've got multiple sets of name value pairs, you'll separate them by commas, as you see here on my screen. And what is also nice about this is that these objects can be nested. Let's see what that uh, example that we looked at earlier of selecting last names from our customers table would look like if we're extracting this as JSON. So once again, we've got our last name column from salesLT.customer. Once again, I'm selecting only the, 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 the top five. Uh, and this time, instead of saying for XML auto, we're going to say for JSON auto, and we'll see that that's now being encoded. That's being passed out to us, uh, wrapped in square brackets, with then each record or row from the source table being wrapped in curly braces as a name value pair. So last name G, last name Harris, last name Carreras. And if you're reading this, you're thinking, well, gee, that's a little bit redundant, just, just like it was in XML. But the idea is that each value stands alone. We can tell what it is while we're looking at it. What's Gates? Gates is a last name. So with JSON, just like we could with XML, we also have some programmatic ways to handle it. So I might declare uh, an nvarchar variable to put JSON data is. And when I do that, I'm going to create a, a, a schema using uh, my key and value and type but I don't necessarily have to strongly type these the way that I would XML or, or even T-SQL data. Um, this can be assigned uh, when I actually populate it. So I might declare this variable and then use the open JSON function to pull whatever values are out of that. So I might have um, a, a va values of nulls or strings or, or numbers. Uh, I can also store Booleans. So the idea here is that if you're already using JSON in an application or you want to use JSON in your application, you can take advantage of SQL Server and Azure SQL Database to store these. All right, well, uh, let's take a look at uh, working with JSON then. Sounds good. Here's a demo. So to talk about DocumentDB, we need to uh, talk a little bit about what it means to be a document and then what kind of DB we're going to use and why we bother. I mean, we just finished talking about JSON, where we knew we could talk about the key value pairs and just store them as strings. Uh, but let's, let's dive into this a little bit more deeply. So first off, let's note that when we talk about a document in the context of DocumentDB, we are not talking about Word or uh, an Excel, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF. Um, what we're talking about instead is a JSON document. In other words, a collection of those, those key uh, uh, value pairs that we talked about in the previous section. And uh, in the absence of something like a document DB, remember there's no schema, there's no implied structure. Uh, you, you, you come as you are here, and if you're storing it in something like SQL Server in an Envarchar co uh, column, then you're just storing text, and it's up to the application to interpret. And that's fine, but we can go a little bit further when it comes to storage and when it comes to things like availability and that sort of thing. And that's where document DB comes into play. Right? We want to be, have a repository for this, and we don't necessarily want to have to roll our own and take responsibility for uh, a number of the, the administrative and the maintenance uh, sides of things.
So first, let's differentiate uh, between your classic SQL in a, in a normalized database uh, and then what we're talking about here with document DB. So as I move from uh, left to right on my slide here, we're talking about a client application sending or receiving information about, say, a car. Uh, and in the case of working with classic SQL Server, classic relational data, um, we have to have a way of mapping the objects that we're representing in our code to the storage in the database. And that's the process of normalization. We pretty, pretty much pull that car apart into a million pieces and we store them in all the parts that uh, are, are similar, are stored in similar tables or what have you. Now with something like uh, document DB and this whole no, uh, NoSQL movement, we have the ability to store it just the way we want. And that's sort of the, my bottom right here with come as you are. So um, how do we uh, store this? What, what can we use? And that's where Azure Document DB comes into play. Um, I won't read this slide to you, but I want to call out a couple of key points, and then I'll show you a little bit more in the demonstration. Um, the primary thing from the perspective of the database developer is that this is a fully managed system. Uh, you send and receive JSON, uh, and the D uh, document DB service takes care of it. Uh, you query over JSON. You don't need to worry about uh, supplying a schema. Yeah, you'll be able to store and work with multiple documents in the same transaction. Uh, you don't have to worry about the performance other than deciding that you want a higher performing system or you don't need a higher performing system and you can slide your performance uh, uh, settings and, and save cost. The other, the other key concept here is that uh, we have full replication. The, the latency guarantees and the service level agreement are, are, are in place for you. You don't have to build this yourself. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, document DB in this demo. So we've traveled a bit off the beaten track in this module and looked at some NoSQL um, storage. Uh, just remind us again what we, we covered in the module. You bet. So we started by talking about XML, and we talked about using the uh, native to SQL Server XML data type for better interoperability and to be able to enforce schemas. We then moved on and talked about JSON, and unlike XML, uh, JSON is much more compact and less verbose, but it doesn't have its own data type, so we looked at using the NVARCHAR data type for that. When we got beyond simply loading uh, JSON strings into SQL Server, we also took a look at using the Azure Document DB service to store those documents and be able to retrieve those. Nice. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this module on, on uh, NoSQL data, I guess. Um, the next module we're going to do is the last module in the course, and we're going to turn our attention, rather than working with data in the database, to managing the operations of the database and start looking at the, the DBA stuff. Yep. So join us for that. Welcome back to our sixth and final module on basic database administration. We'll take a, a brief look at the role of the DBA, the database administrator, and uh, see what kinds of things need to be done. Sounds good. Let's, uh, let's dive into it. Well, there are a number of things that uh, you need to think about and prepare for a successful uh, installation of SQL Server. Um, underneath the SQL Server application itself, there are some pieces. And you may not be responsible for all of these. Your, your team might be responsible for pieces. You might have other teams, such as the network and infrastructure people. But let's sort of put it all out there in terms of what you want to be thinking about and make sure you have information about uh, before you deploy SQL Server. So it starts with the OS. What OS are you going to use? Now, sometimes that decision made for you, uh, especially if you're going to deploy to Azure, uh, the, uh, which, which version you're using or which edition you're using locally may be something that you don't have a decision about, but you need to know whether that version of the OS and that edition of the OS will support the features you want. Then you want to think about storage. SQL Server requires its program files to be stored locally or in, in your VM. Uh, then you've got your database files and your log files. Are they going to be local? Are they going to be on a SAN? What about storage in, in an Azure VM, for example? Uh, how much memory do you think you, you're going to need? Uh, SQL Server it likes memory. It, it, it needs a lot of memory to work with a lot of data. Now, how much do you think you need? Now, now double it, really. Um, what about the network? How are you going to access the application ac across the network? What about firewalls? So now we've got a, our, our, our infrastructure topics. What about SQL Server itself? Well, what edition are you going to use? Um, at a very high level, you're comparing the uh, functionality that SQL Server provides against the different editions and against the cost of the product. 
What features do you need? Uh, do you need to support SharePoint? What about BI? Uh, there will be some decisions you'll make during setup. Then you'll need to provision accounts uh, for the SQL services, for the administrators, for users of various levels. And then there are always going to be some post-installation configuration settings you'll need to ensure that the database server is running optimally. So when we've got all of this, we've thought about what it's going to take to deploy a SQL Server. Right, so you've told us a little bit about uh, installing and getting the, the configuration up and running. Uh, we've been using SQL Server all the way through the course. Yep. I guess now we really need to learn how to install it. So can you, uh, can you yep. show us? Yep, let's solve our chicken and egg problem and uh, take a look at provisioning SQL Server in an Azure Virtual Machine. Great. For this demo, I'm going to get started with Azure SQL Database. And the reason I'll do that will, will be clear, I hope, because it's going to take a few minutes for it to run in the background, and I can cut over and show you how to create databases in uh, SQL Server Management Studio for on-premise databases or virtual machines. So let's start here at the Azure portal. I've logged in with my Microsoft account. I'm looking at my dashboard, and I'm going to create a new Azure SQL database. And there will be a number of, of decisions you'll need to make, and this course isn't designed to go through all of those decisions and all of those configuration options, but you'll get a flavor of uh, what's involved. Um, I do want to commend you to some of our other MVA programs on uh, Azure SQL database. So I'm going to go ahead and specify that I want to create a new database. And I'll go to Data and Storage, and I'll choose SQL Database. And the blade will open where I can start the configuration. I'll be asked for a name. It'll populate with my subscription information. And there'll be other information I'll change as I go. So one of the most important things, of course, is going to be the name of the database, because that's going to be used by every application uh, and perhaps every ad hoc report user that's going to be connecting to this. So I'll give this, hopefully, a clear name. Uh, we'll call this uh, MV MVA uh, Fundamentals Demo. And I'll use my Azure subscription. Um, Azure offers a couple of different ways of deploying SQL databases. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've made these before, and I'll use an existing resource group to make it easier for myself to clean up. I've got a resource group called MVA Demos. But as you get deeper into Azure, you'll find that there are a number of resources that get created uh, just in the process of creating a virtual machine or a SQL database or other items. And resource groups are a nice way to uh, keep them together and make it convenient to manage. All right, well, I want to create a new database, and Azure uh, gives me the opportunity here to either start from scratch with a blank database, uh, to use one of the samples available, or even to restore from a backup of another SQL database in Azure. Um, I'll start with a blank database. I'm then asked what logical server I want to put this on, and I have the ability either to choose from one of my existing logical servers, or I can create a new server and, and walk through that whole process. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to keep this fairly straightforward. I'll use one of my existing servers. Um, but I do want to point out that if you're going to create your, new, your own new server, uh, you will need to configure firewall rules to enable you to connect to it, and you will need, uh, you will need to uh, provision uh, an administrator account. All right, so let's go ahead and walk down through my choices. Now, what pricing tier do I want? Um, this is a much longer discussion than we're going to have right now. But in a nutshell, a pricing tier uh, is a way of bundling a performance level in something we call database transaction units. And it's a combination of uh, compute resources and storage resources and some other features that enable us to uh, control how responsive the SQL database is going to be. For the purposes of this demo, I'll choose a P1. We'll see that's going to give me up to 500 gigabytes of storage. It's going to automatically include geo-replication and point-in-time restore. Uh, there are a whole long list of these uh, pricing tiers. Uh, and again, I encourage you to hit the Azure documentation to learn the differences between them if you're going to be using Azure SQL databases. I'm also going to be asked about a collation, and uh, a collation in brief is a combination of uh, character set and sort order, which will uh, uh, drive how things like your applications will uh, communicate with uh, the database. I'll leave my default here, my SQL Latin 1 general code page 1, case insensitive ascending sort. That's my default here in, uh, in uh, the US. 
When I'm done with this, I'll want it to be pinned to the dashboard of the portal just for convenience. That doesn't really have anything to do with creating a database, but it will make it easier for me to find it and show it to you. All right, well, I'll go ahead and, and click Create. And it says, hey, if you made any changes in some of the other blades, uh, we're going to get rid of them. That's fine with me. And I'll see a message here that says that I am uh, submitting the deployment to the server. That's going to take a few minutes, so I'm going to let that cook in the background. And in the meantime, I'm going to switch over to SQL Server Management Studio, which I have connected to a local instance here on my laptop. So let's put the portal away for now, and let's bring up SQL Server Management Studio. And here in SQL Server Management Studio for SQL Server 2016, uh, I've got a connection to my local laptop here, which is called Shoal. I am logged in as myself, um, and I've given myself, uh, during installation, I've given myself uh, administrative privileges. But one of the things you want to make sure you do when you install your own SQL Server is make sure that you also create an account that has permissions to access it, and uh, for that first account anyway, permission to do things like create databases and so forth. So in this view of SQL Server Management Studio, I have a list of what databases are available to me on this particular instance. Um, and as we mentioned in the presentation, an instance is uh, essentially a running copy of SQL Server. You can have multiple instances on one machine uh, based on what the uh, resource load is going to be and how much performance your machine has. Um, and on this instance, I have uh, several user databases. There's an old sample here called AdventureWorks 2016 CTP3, and then a couple of samples that I I pulled down from Microsoft.com that are the new samples for SQL Server 2016. Um, in this interface, I have access to the databases and the objects within them. Everything from tables and views and the service broker settings and security settings. But I've also got access to system level features such as system level security. Who's allowed to log in to uh, this instance? What are they allowed to do when they get here? And so on. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, I simply want to set up a database and make it ready for future demos. So I'm going to start by generating a script from one of the existing databases and reviewing its results. So using a feature of SQL Server Management Studio, I'm right-clicking on Wide World Importers. I'm going to specify that I want to script it out as a create operation to a new editor window. Now I could script this right to a file on disk, I could script this to my clipboard and so on, but let's use a new query editor window. And we'll see a lot of T-SQL has been generated here. And we're not going to walk through all of this, but I do want to show you some of the critical things that are part of creating a new database in SQL Server. So I'll walk through and I'll highlight certain key things as we go. And if you're interested in more of, of uh, the other options, uh, I encourage you to take a look at, at uh, uh, MSDN and Books Online, and I encourage you to take a look at some of our other courses. So the first thing this script had to do was to switch to the master database, which is a, a system level configuration database. And then we'll see comments, which are these bits in, well, they were in green before I uh, highlighted them in yellow, but we'll see those are T-SQL comments. And that's simply documenting what's being scripted at any given point when the script was generated. And now we get to the good part, the create database statement. So that's, that's our key. And there are many, many options, but we're going to focus on the, the, the core ones here. So we'll say create database, and we'll give that database a name, such as create database wide world importers. At a minimum, that's all you need to do. SQL Server comes with a number of default settings, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some of those when we create our own database in a few minutes. But at a minimum, that will then put the, the data files and transaction log files for this database in the default locations for that particular server instance. It will have a default size and other default settings. But let's review some of those settings that are available to us. So create database wide world importers. Uh, we'll, we'll skip containment for, for now, but that's a, a security feature for later. Then there's a setting here for what file group it's going, uh, uh, going to be uh, using. Then this is going to be one called user data. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a more advanced course. But the key thing here is that we're specifying that this database has a file that we're going to give a nickname or a logical name of WWI primary. And the actual file is going to be located in my file system. Now, that is a default location, and we never recommend that you uh, place your user databases in that default location. And once you're in an environment with uh, a SAN, for example, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be placing your data files on that SAN. But I've got a, 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 just a, a developer laptop here, and I'm putting things in local locations that aren't going to live forever, so I'm not terribly worried about the, the uh, locations. However, just for comparison's sake, let me just show you what 
I've done here for my own databases. Uh, on my C drive, I've created a, uh, a, a folder called SQL Data. Whoops. And uh, trying to zoom in so we can see it. And uh, uh, I've just, on my SQL Data directory here, I've created some folders here for data transaction logs, and backup. And then I've marked those as the default for this instance so that as I add new databases, they will by default be placed in those locations. And we'll take a look at how that goes. All right, let's get back to SQL Server Management Studio. So one of the things we need to do to create a database is we need to specify where the files are going to go. And at a minimum, you'll start with two types of files in a SQL Server. You'll start with a data file. And so if we scroll all the way to the end of this long path, we'll see that we're creating a data file called wideworldimporters.mdf. MDF is just a convention for the extension. There's no requirement that you call it that way, but it, that's what most of us tend to do so that other DBAs looking at our work can understand what they're seeing. And as I mentioned, there are defaults for lots and lots of things, but you can also specify things like what the starting size is going to be, whether it can grow, and if so, how much, and what that growth increment should be. And these we get into in, in more advanced uh, uh, developer and administrative courses, but just understand that there are a number of things you can do to control that, and we'll take a look at them uh, a, a little later. So we'll create a, a, a initial data file. There's some other files here that this particular sample is using. I'm going to ignore for now. And we'll also specify then that we need a transaction log. And so we're creating something here called WWI log. And again, it's got a long path and file name here to create a file called worldwideimporters.ldf. And that transaction log file is so important to SQL Server because of the way the SQL Server engine uh, writes changes from memory down to disk and records a history of those actions in the transaction log. So to create a database at a minimum, we're going to want a data file, and we're going to want a log, and we're either going to uh, specify our own settings, or we're going to uh, allow the defaults to kick in. And for the purposes of our discussion here, the rest of all of these settings are simply ways of recording in the script what the DBA who created this database did uh, in setting it up. So let's take another approach to this. If I go back to my Object Explorer, and I right click on the databases folder under my instance, I can click on new database and I'll get a dialog box with some choices very similar to what we've just been looking at. Such as what do we want to call our new database? Where do you want the data file to go and what should it be called? Where do you want the log file and, where sh and what should it be called? And a long list of options, many of which were recorded in that script that we just looked at. So let's take a, a, a straightforward starting approach to creating a new database, and I will call this MVA demo local DB, as opposed to the cloud database that I've got running in the background right now. And I will review then the logical names for the files that will be created. So MVA demo local DB and MVA lo uh, demo local DB log. We'll see that this is going to be for data rows and this is going to be for transaction log items. We'll see it's creating a default primary file group. We can specify our initial size in megabytes. So let's just go 500, for example, and an initial size for the log. I'm not going to do a lot with this database, so I don't need a lot of storage to record changes. We can, if we want, get into auto growth settings. Uh, we'll talk more about those in other courses. And then finally, we can choose where we want um, these files to go. And I don't want them to go under C program files. So I'll go ahead and select that folder that I showed you earlier, which on, was on my C drive, uh, SQL data. And this is going to go in the data folder. And my log is going to go in my logs folder. And because I'm working on a laptop that only has a single drive, I really can't show you best practices such as putting the data file or files and the transaction log on separate disks or separate uh, units in a SAN. Uh, this is as close as I can get, but it'll help sort of plant that seed that we want our databases and our logs uh, in, in separate locations for, for performance and uh, to some extent for fault tolerance. All right, and then finally I'll be asked to give these names, and if I leave it blank, it'll just name it after the, the, uh, the logical name, so I'm simply going to leave it blank. And at this point, again, I could review other options and to add file groups for adding additional files. Um, I won't do that for this particular database. If I'm ready to go, I can just click OK, but before I do that, let me go ahead and tell this to take what I've done here and script this out to a new window. <clears throat> 
so that when I click OK, while we're waiting for the engine to build that database, we can go and review what instructions it was just given. So there's my T-SQL, create this database. And that primary file group is going to be that file called mvalocaldb.mdf on my C SQL data data folder. Same idea with the log, the initial settings I'd created. And then all of those other options that we don't have the opportunity to get into right now. But we've now got a database. I'm going to close this without saving because I know I had asked the management studio to create that for me. And I would expect now to see my database here in the list of database. And sure enough, there is MVA demo local DB. And we'll see in SSMS here, Management Studio, the, con the, the containers here where we'll then be able to get in and do things like add tables and so forth, which we'll get into later in this course. So in this part of the demo, we've gone ahead and created a brand new database. We can connect to that database and st start uh, writing queries with it, adding objects, and we'll get into those things as the course goes on. Okay, well, I've switched over to the browser, and I'm looking at my Azure portal, and it appears that the uh, deployment has been completed. I've got a little notifications icon here that says, yep, you, your deployments have succeeded. And it opened up the, the settings blade for this particular database. Now, I'm going to close this just to show you that when I'd asked it to pin it to the dashboard, this is what I'm seeing. I'll go ahead and click on that and reopen that, those settings. And we'll be able to confirm what I provided earlier, such as what's, what resource group is this going into, MVA demos. What server did I choose to put that on? That was one of my existing logical servers. What pricing tier was the server? What pricing tier is the database? We can get in and look at lots of other uh, information as we go along. So at this point in Azure, I've got an Azure SQL database. I've, in other words, I've got a SQL database in the cloud, and I can connect to it from my local tools or from an application or from a website the same way that I could connect to my, uh, my local instance of SQL Server that I was demonstrating a few minutes ago. Um, in order to do that, I've got to make some changes here in Azure that will enable me to do that. And so the first thing I want to look at, for example, are my database connection string. So I'm going to click on that link and it'll open up. It'll say, OK, here's what your uh, connection string needs to be if you're writing an ADO.NET application or if you're using ODBC or JDBC. And the main thing I want to focus on here, let me go ahead and highlight this bit and zoom in on it. The main thing I want to focus on there is that the server name is that logical name we saw in the, the, uh, the, the uh, property sheet when I was building the database. So MVA SQL DBCR dot database dot windows dot net. We're going to provide a fully qualified domain name to be able to connect to this. We'll use port 1433, which is what we see after the comma here. And in our connection string, we're saying that our initial catalog is MVA fundamentals demo. In other words, that's the name of the database to connect to. So I can use that information in my client tool to be able to connect, and uh, we'll be using this information in subsequent demonstrations in this course. So later in the course, I'll go to SQL Server Management Studio, for example, and I'll connect to this database. And while I'll be using the tools locally, the data will be stored in Azure. Other things I might need to be aware of are at the server level. So I'll go to the server name, I'll click on my uh, server link, and we'll see among other things, what databases live on that server, and currently this is the only one. And we'll see the account name of the server admin, that's, that's my name, CF Randall, and I'll need to remember the password I used when I created this server. And then we'll be able to add additional accounts either here in the portal, or we can add them within SQL Server Management Studio or through T-SQL scripts um, in the way that we would be uh, creating accounts uh, on an on-premise SQL Server. So we need an account that's allowed to connect, and we also need the ability to connect across the network. And so I've got show firewall settings highlighted here, and I'll bring that up, and we'll see what ranges of addresses, IP addresses, are allowed to talk to this. And this is a very important consideration. The Azure portal will allow you to create a logical database server in Azure and create databases on that server that nobody can connect to by default, including you, other than through the portal. So one of the important things to do is to uh, configure firewall settings. And we've got a much longer explanation of this on MVA in our, uh, in our course on uh, Azure SQL Database Security. Uh, but the key thing here is that I need to en uh, enable a, the client IP address that I'm connecting from to connect to this server. 
And so helpfully, the portal shows me what my IP address is. However, I do know that um, I'm working from within the Microsoft corporate network and any number of arranged addresses might be actually used to connect uh, outside to Azure. So what I'm more likely to do than add my own IP is to create a rule that's called uh, corp and give it a range of addresses. And so I might go ahead and copy in the, uh, the start of this just to save me a little bit of typing. and allow for an entire range of, of addresses that I'm going to connect from. And I'll go ahead and tell it to save my changes. And as long as I'm connecting from one of the IP addresses in that range, I should be good to go. Okay, so I've got my firewall settings configured and saved for this range of IP addresses. Um, I'm going to switch over to SQL Server Management Studio and uh, connect to this uh, Azure SQL database. So here in SQL Server Management Studio, I've pressed my Connect button up here in the Object Explorer toolbar, and I've got my Connect to Server box showing. So I'll put in that four-part name that I highlighted before. There's my uh, MVA SQL DBCR dot database dot Windows dot net comma 1433, just like it was in the connection string. And I'll be using SQL Server authentication because I don't have uh, Active Directory authentication configured for this database. Uh, that is a feature of Azure SQL databases. If you do have your on-premises Active Directory uh, federated to the cloud or you're using Azure Active Directory already, you can configure a database to uh, use those accounts. I haven't done so for this demo, so I'll just use the account that I created in setting all this up. And that's my login CF Randall that I showed you as the server admin, and I've already put in my password uh, so that I don't have to type it. So let's go ahead and connect. And in a moment, we should see down at the bottom of my list of, of servers that I'm connected to, I should see my servers and I should see my database that I created, and I'm ready to go. So in this demo, we've got two databases ready to work with. One is an on-premise SQL Server database, and the other is an Azure SQL database. Uh, I can use either of them for any of the T-SQL demonstrations that we'll be doing, uh, and other database demonstrations we'll be doing in this course. Part of a DBA's responsibilities include protecting the database from loss. Now, that may be loss caused by users, that may be loss from equipment failure or a disaster, and uh, in SQL Server, you're going to handle that primarily by backup and restore. Now, there are other mechanisms for implementing uh, uh, protection, including high availability, but we're going to focus on um, the backup process here. So um, what SQL Server is going to provide for us is going to be the ability to do a complete backup, a full backup, or a partial backup where we might say, I only want to back up these particular files. Um, the ability to do transaction log backups, which will give you point in time recovery. That's where you're backing up the, the log that is recording all of the activity against your database in real time. And being able to say, I need to go back an hour ago, or I need to go back to this morning before something happened. Now, one of the things you have to decide when you're backing up is where is that going to go? Are you backing up locally or are you backing up to the cloud? And there are an increasing number of options as, as the products mature uh, to be able to help you uh, make that decision and help you implement it. So this is where you get to save me from myself when I've accidentally <laughs> dropped a table instead of right. deleting a row. How do I uh, get that back from my backup? All right, let's, uh, let's go learn the undo command with backing up and restoring. Great. So let's talk security. Uh, this course isn't designed to be a comprehensive introduction to the topic. Uh, we do have longer form MVA content on security that I encourage you to take a look at. But let's talk about the basics. When it comes to database security, there are a number of building blocks to be aware of. The first one I want to talk about is authentication, which is to say, who are you? And how do I know it's really you? Uh, there are a couple of different ways to handle that through uh, your Active Directory Im uh, implementation, through what we call SQL authentication, where you'll enter a username and password. There are digital certificates. There are a number of things that you can implement. So now that we know who you are, what are you allowed to do? That's authorization. And that's where you start to get into things like permissions. And those permissions may be assigned to you as an individual. They may be assigned to a group that you're a member of. Uh, or you may be an administrator and have permission to do anything. So we've got authentication. Who are you? 
authorization, what are you allowed to do? Another building block of this is encryption, which is to say protecting the data. And there are a number of different aspects of this as well. Uh, are we encrypting the data at rest while it's stored in the tables? Or are we storing it in, in, in plain uh, uh, unencrypted data and encrypting it as it crosses the wire between the database server and the application through connection encryption? So we've got authentication, authorization, encryption, and our final block is going to be auditing. Auditing is, what did you do? So we've got authentication, who are you? Authorization, what are you allowed to do? And then auditing, what did you do? And there are a number of different approaches in SQL Server for auditing, uh, recording commands given uh, or recording what objects were accessed or what have you. And taken all together, these things provide the basic building blocks of security in SQL Server. So here's where you get to show me how to protect myself from these nefarious people who want to get to my data. <laughs> Let's take a look at security. So our next topic is monitoring and maintenance. So if you're the DBA and you've gone through all of the work to install and configure SQL Server, to load data, to secure your data, um, your ongoing operations are going to be monitoring and maintenance. So let's talk about what's involved there. One of the things you'll be responsible for as a DBA is tracking server and database health. And by health, we mean uh, how, how is the system performing? Uh, are there any errors? Is there any corruption in the data? What's the resource usage like? Uh, start to think about upgrades to the system. Are we going to need more memory down the road? Are we going to need more CPUs? Uh, you'll track job execution because a lot of what happens uh, for a DBA is something that can be scheduled and executed uh, unattended. Things like backups, for example, because you don't want to be there at 2 a.m. issuing a backup command. So you'll run a scheduled job and you'd like to know whether it worked or not. Speaking of backups, a very important role of the DBA is validating backups because just because you've backed up the uh, data doesn't mean that it was backed up successfully and it doesn't mean that you can restore it successfully. So testing your backups is very important. Another ongoing uh, operation for a DBA is going to be tuning indexes. Uh, while a developer may have created the indexes, it's going to be your responsibility to track their usage, to see uh, whether they are uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, do you need to add new indexes to support operations? Do you need to drop duplicate indexes? We've got lots of coverage of these topics in other courses. And then periodically you may need to uh, handle updates, whether it's Windows update to the OS, whether it's updates and, and cumulative updates and service packs to SQL Server or the next version down the road. All of these things fall into uh, the realm of the DBA. So it's your final chance to show me how things work. Let's take a look at monitoring and maintaining. All right, here's the demo. All right, well, let's wrap up what we've uh, talked about in this module on basic database administration. What does it take to become a basic DBA? Well, we started by talking about choosing the addition of SQL Server that suited our needs. We talked about the basics of configuring disk usage, memory allocation, and network support. We talked about the need uh, to protect your data from gram with uh, regular backups <laughs> and to make sure you practice restoring. Uh, it's really important that you restore and know how to, how to do that. Uh, we also looked at uh, security through controlling access and uh, reminding you to audit activity. It's no good to, uh, to lock things up and realize you've forgotten something and have no way of, of, of testing that. And finally, we took a look at ongoing uh, monitoring and maintenance tasks, including uh, monitoring your server and database health, uh, utilization, and uh, maintaining indexes as needed. What do you think, Graham? I, th I think we've pretty much covered, uh, covered the entire gamut of, of what we can do. It's, it's been a really uh, interesting course covering all sorts of aspects of working with databases, right from you know starting with that little Excel spreadsheet with our data in it, right the way through to working with tables, storing data in the tables, our CRUD operations against them, optimizing the performance, and then uh, looking at things like NoSQL data that we might want to store, and then finally the, the, the idea of uh, maintaining and managing that database, the operational side of things. So it's a really uh, comprehensive kind of look 
at a fundamental level, I guess, is the way that I would sure. put that. A nice broad look at all the things that are involved in working with databases at the fundamental level. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Um, there are other classes here on MBA, and there are other courses that, that Microsoft offer that take you deeper into each of these areas of working with databases. Hopefully this has whet your appetite and got you uh, more interested in learning more about working with databases. And we'll see you back on another course some other future time. All right, thanks for watching, folks.